Yeah. He goes. He goes that well. It was very, very uncomfortable. What's the word? He's recovering. It's real. He's okay for me to take a few days. We're on the air. Oh. Yep. We are. Here's your one minute warning, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the July 16th, 2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, can you please take the roll? Mr. Dupree? <laughs> Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Oculus? Thank you. Next item is the approval of minutes from the June 25th meeting. Uh, I know we received these fairly recently. I don't know if folks have had a chance to review them. And for the record, I was not present at that meeting. Yeah, that was also no. Yeah, so, okay. I don't so we can table this table mm -hmm. approval of those minutes until the next meeting. All right, thank you. First action item number five: Star Homes requests a subdivision amendment for 62 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map R59, Lot Number Two. And I apologize, but one more housekeeping note: uh, Item number eight on the agenda, Bluebird Self Storage, was tabled at the request of the applicant. Got a couple loose ends there. Um, we'll go back to item number five, Star Homes, and Jamel, would you like to introduce this? Sure, thank you. Uh, so this uh, Solidgrass Subdivision Second Amendment, uh, located in the VR4 Zoning District. So the proposal is before the board for an amendment to the previous approved Solidgrass Subdivision. Uh, as the board may remember, the applicant was granted subdivision approval in October of 2014 and received approval for the first amendment in November of 2015. So two items to discuss and take action on tonight. Uh, the first one um, is the approved subdivision plans identify that one lot will be developed as an affordable housing unit. The applicant is now requesting to pay the in lieu fee for $20,000 instead of providing the affordable housing unit in the subdivision. The zoning ordinance does allow for a density bonus either by providing the affordable housing unit in the development or util utilizing the in lieu fee to support the town's affordable housing initiatives. The applicant has met with staff in the Town's Affordable Housing Alliance and they are supportive of this request. just want to remind the board that utilizing the in lieu fee does require uh, official board approval. And number two is the applicant is proposing to amend the requirement to install six-foot arborvitae trees along the rear of lots 18 through 24. As the board may recall during the approval process in 2014, the intent of these trees along the rear lot lines was to provide separation from the adjacent hot lot house lots in the village green open space. So the board should consider the appropriateness of the applicant's request and uh, whether the, this request meets the intent of the zoning ordinance in the original subdivision approval in 2014. That's what I have. All right. Thanks, Jamel. Um, would the applicant like to add anything? <coughs> My name is Joe Fistacci. I'm the developer of Sawgrass. Uh, as Jamel stated, we uh, received approvals October of 14. Since then, I have been working with the Alliance, city official, uh, town officials to uh, identify language um, which would include maximum income, maximum sale price, and how to maintain this property as an affordable home in perpetuity. Uh, it's a difficult process and the uh, bottom line at this particular time is they need more time to uh, 
develop language to accommodate an affordable home in a subdivision. Uh, and that's why I'm asking for the, uh, the reason I'm asking for the request to uh, pay a fee in lieu is this is the last lot to be developed in the subdivision and we want to close it out and move on. So I have no objection in paying the $20,000. So hopefully we'll address this item first and then go on to the second one. Or do you want me to continue on the second request? I, you can go ahead and go through each of the requests on this particular item. Okay, the second item is to uh, make changes to uh, sheet 19, uh, 9 of the subdivision approval. Um, the neighbors, uh, the homeowners in there, and I'm surprised there aren't any here. I don't see anybody from Sawgrass. They were adamant. They've talked to uh, Jay on a number of occasions. They've had some meetings to delete the... Uh, the Abbevitis, and um, Jay has indicated that this is a planning board decision. We have met all the other requirements. We have fences uh, in the back, uh, two sections of a post and rail fence to separate the property lines from the uh, open space. We have the walking trail in. We have uh, several boulders in place. We have the benches. The only thing remaining would be the Abavides, but the homeowners in mass have attacked me and uh, asked for me not to plant them. So um, I'm here tonight to ask the planning board to delete that from uh, sheet nine and to um, also um, the active space. Uh, they're not excited about bocce ball or community gardens. So we would like to make this at the discretion of the homeowners association and let them identify what they want. And I think I just came online. <laughs> so those are the two requests that uh, Star Homes is, is requesting, and uh, I'm here to answer questions. All right, thank you. Uh, before the board uh, deliberates, we do have the opportunity for public comment on this item. If there is anyone here who would like to come on up, this would be the time. Seeing none, um, I will just note that we did receive uh, some correspondence from uh, we've, well, a couple of the neighbors um, basically uh, supporting what the applicant has stated about preference to not have the arborvitae. Um, and all board members have that in their, in their materials. Um, so again, seeing no interest in public comment, we'll turn to the board. Uh, Nick, would you like to start off? Sure. Um, so as far as your uh, request for the affordable housing, I have no problem with, uh, with that. The question I have for you is instead of putting in, and I also don't have a problem with the trees, we do have a letter here from the neighbor stating that they would rather not see the trees be placed. So um, the neighbor's saying they don't want them, why force it in there? Um, the question I have for you, though, is regarding the recreational area that was proposed to be developed at some point. Is it your intent to make some sort of contribution to the HOA to help develop that area? That's not my intent, no. No. Um, this is something that they don't want. We had started uh, the community garden um, plan, but they're not interested in it. Uh, and I can see uh, from both perspectives here that that's their community now. And you've got one home left to develop and they're probably best suited to determine what's gonna suit their needs for that area. I think my concern is if some of those homeowners purchased in thinking, this is what I'm gonna see when I when this development is done and now what do I have? And there could be a, an assessment to create this down the road on some of those owners' behalf from the homeowners association. Um, that would be my only uh, consternation with what I'm seeing here. And I wish that these homeowners were, were here tonight. Uh, no one has indicated to me that they want uh, a fee in lieu of recreational areas. I don't believe anybody bought in there with the idea that um, they were expecting um, the bocce ball court. Um, this is just something that they said they don't want. Roger? Um, I don't have any problems with any of this, except I, just, I do have a question. 
Lot 24 is the one you're going to relinquish in lieu of? No, it's lot number one, which is. Oh, lot number one? Yes, it's the one, the first one in on the right hand side. Oh, okay, yes. okay. Yes. Um, no, I, I, um, I actually drove through the place at development the other day. I've been through it a few times anyways, and I can understand because you've got all brush and everything growing up behind most of these homes as Correct. it is right now, so I have no problem with anything here. All right, thanks. Robin? Oh. Um, so, um, with respect to uh, issue number one, the affordable housing in Luffy, I have no problem um, with, with that. And I understand the reason why is because it is a difficult process and that needs time for to developing language. Um, but I guess I'm just wondering if you can also give a reason, so I, I'm definitely in agreement with that, but I'm if, wondering if you can give a reason for number two and number three, the Arbor Vitae and the improvements to the to the village green area, just for the record. For the record, is it's not my idea to delete them. The homeowners have been insistent that they don't want them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. And they feel as though there's maintenance, yeah. a lot more maintenance involved in it. Okay. Um, insurance reasons. Okay. Um, these are some of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the rationale that some of the people have, have offered to me. So can you talk to me about, I work with homeowners associations mm -hmm. quite a lot for in, my, in my day job, and their involvement, their enthusiasm, and their momentum can wax and wane throughout the years. So can you tell me a little bit about the homeowner association, um, how many active members you have, how many, have you got a letter from the board, Are, is the, because usually the developer is on, you know, the housing, the, the homeowners association at first, or any type of um, organization. Has your position on the homeowners association sort of been deleted by more active members? Well, I still have the homeowners association in my name. Okay. It hasn't been turned over to them as yet. Okay. We're close to it. We're finishing the, the subdivision up. So they are speaking as a community now and not as a homeowners association. And they're asking that the homeowners association be in charge of any decisions that may be made there since I'm leaving the, the uh, um, subdivision itself. Okay. And so there is no other, there's no one who, there's no sort of like heir apparent to be the president or I vice can't president. speak to that. I think that there, there's been a, a couple of strong people. And I guess the reason that I'm asking is that the trees are there for, you know, as far as um, zoning and standards are concerned. Uh, trees, trees can have more than just um, a barrier effect. They, they promote drainage, they provide shade, habitat, clean air, and increase property value. So I'm wondering if the Homeowner Association has, has really vetted all these issues through. There are a lot of trees in the back of these homes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the um, limitations that I had in the subdivision is no further cutting of trees in the open space area. So there's plenty of trees there. Uh, there's plenty of green space also. Mm -hmm. um, so how many been, people would you say are active in the homeowner association? Well, then? there's 20, 22 homeown uh, houses sold. So there's 22. Did families. they come? Do you have regular meetings? No, no. Again, the homeowners association has not been established or has not. Um, the the homeowners are not part of the homeowners association as yet. What, else, what I'm getting at... Um, they have had meetings, yes. Okay. I haven't been invited to one. And it's not... Okay. Got it. Okay. Now, um, let me also say that I think, and I wish Jay were here, um, when we did the subdivision, I think it was the suggestion of VH2M <coughs> to add Arbovites along with the post and rail fence. Mm -hmm. I've done two subdivisions yeah. where we have put in... Uh, this is in Scarborough, where yep. we have put in the post and rail fences, mm -hmm. and that's worked. And I think this, this was just an added feature. And I don't know whether it was done because there was a concern about limiting the number of trees, mm -hmm. but there's an abundance of trees back there. And we, we kept the uh, uh, trail so that we meandered in and out of the yep. tree, tree line. And, and so just to, to let, I guess, my fellow board members know where I'm coming down is I agree with number one that in Luffy, it's in accordance with all the rules that we have. I am not inclined to agree with two and three because I believe there might be requirements that those trees were there for, not just to 
partition the community, but to, to adhere to certain standards associated with that. And also, uh, not in agreement with number three, similar to a reason that Mr. McGee brought up, which is maybe folks bought into the idea of having a recreational center and that being done. So with that said, I've, I thank you very much for answering my questions. Thanks. Rachel? Um, my colleagues have done a really good job and asked all the questions I had. Um, I don't have a problem with the in-lieu fee. Uh, I do have, I guess there remains a, a question about um, the, the setup of, of that open space. And I've been a member of homeowners associations before, and I understand that they remain in the hands of the developer until the um, last lot is sold or house built and then there's a formal turnover. I'm just a little uncomfortable um, not knowing what those folks think as a community even though they're not yet uh, a part of a homeowners association. I can, um, I, I hear you loud and clear that uh, from your perspective nobody's come to you or, or folks have spoken to you and they don't have a need for the uh, some of the amenities that you have and you, and you have put in some additional some amenities correct yeah well, uh, I've done, uh, all but the abbevites all okay. but the uh, we have the open space the uh, green space we have the walking trail we have the the, um, the benches the play area um, and the uh, post and rail fences so the Abavites, they've, they've specifically said, we don't want them. And again, um, I have an email. If, if you plan them, we will remove them. So that's, that's how adamant they are that they don't want them. And I don't know what that's uh, You know, saying. that probably would have been helpful to have that email. Um, the, uh, about what percentage of that open space actually is currently treed? I, just a ballpark. 50%. Okay, thank you. All set? Thank you. Um, so it sounds like we have unanimity around the payment in lieu fee of 20000 for affordable housing. Uh, it's good to know that we have the endorsement of the affordable housing group on that. Um, regarding two and three, on number two, I would say my understanding, or at least recollection, was that the Arborvitae was really intended primarily to be um, for delineation of that open space. Um, and I say that, you know, while reiterating that, I certainly don't take lightly the notion of reversing a, a condition of a past approval. Um, but given that the fact that there is fencing um, and other demarcations there, um, and this is a somewhat unique situation where we, we have um, neighborhood in pet input, um, you know, we had the opportunity for additional public comment. We didn't hear any one way or another. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, but I would say that, um, again, you know, I, I don't, I'm not wild about reversing or amending past conditions of approval. It has been done before. I think there needs to be a compelling reason for it and that it can't uh, sort of counterband the spirit and the real core intent of, of the condition. And I see our town engineer wanting to chime in, so please go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I know Jay has spoken, you had mentioned Jay, but, but I have also spoken to, one, one of the residents has been vocal about it. And I know um, those lots along that edge um, are kind of utilizing that as kind of all that space. And I know the rail is more about at the corners. It's not a solid rail fence, is that correct? I think that's correct. I've been out there a few times. So it's more about the residents in the center or away from that space having the ability to use that and delineate mm -hmm. that as separate. Um, but as you said, the, we have heard from um, residents have met. I don't know how many or, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to say, but um, they have, we have heard at least from one um, resident along that edge mm -hmm. that has has discussed removing those be, because of um, more about I think maintaining mm -hmm. those and the cost of maintaining mm -hmm. those the homeowners association association has not been set up that doesn't happen until like we accept the street as Mr. Prostachi said um, which is very typical mm -hmm. um, 
So um, I guess that's all. I just wanted okay. to chime in. Since he had mentioned that Jay had talked to him, I had as well. So I just wanted to kind of throw that I in. I appreciate that. And I, I'd like to say for the record that, I mean, I think one of the reasons that we do sometimes put certain requirements or conditions in place that run with, run with the land, run with the, um, the approved plan, and really transcend whoever happens to live there at that moment is that there are some some bigger picture, longer term considerations. And so, you know, when we hear references to people saying they would rip things out, you know, um, that's not something we like to hear. Um, but um, that said, I mean, it is a somewhat unusual situation where we we don't often um, we don't often get feedback from individual house lot owners. Um, after we've already approved something and it's already in process or, or largely complete. Um, I, I'm going to exercise some discretion as chair here, and I know there's at least one uh, neighbor who, sh who uh, showed up a little bit late, and I'd like to give, give them the opportunity to, to speak and maybe give us a little more flavor on this. Thank you. Sure. I apologize for being late. I got here as soon as I could. David Wood, a little bit eight sawgrass. It's the first lot on the left as you drive in. And I did want to talk about some of these things. First of all, I want to thank Joe for all the work that he's done for that common land area. I know you put a, a ton of work into that, and it, it looks great. Um, regarding specifically the arborvitaes and the fences, I think one of the things that gets lost in that diagram is the lot sizes. These are really tiny lots. Um, they're not measured in acres there, it's square feet. So the <laughs> line between our patio or deck and the common land beginning is, is 10, 15 feet. So we're, we're talking about putting a wall of our varieties. And we already have wooden fences on either. So the way the wooden fences are set up is at the corners of each property. So I happen to have a corner lot, so on one, I have kind of a like that, and then the other one, it's because there are two properties, there are two sections of fence. So that kind of goes all along and chains. Well, so there's no solid fence between them. Each property would have two pieces of fence around them. To put then a wall of our varieties in between those wooden fences, I think is aesthetically not very pleasing, but also given how little space that there is right now, blocking all that common area of view, right now it's great because it's all open and you feel like it's an open neighborhood. We have a path behind that and we have a lot of woods behind that. So the trees that we're talking about, this wooded area, they're only 50 feet away and it's a whole section of forest. So to put up a wall to segregate the homeowners from this common area, I think is actually detrimental to, I think if, if the properties were much bigger, and if these were 100 feet away, I think it would make a lot, sen a lot of sense. But putting them where we are now, I think, creates an artificial barrier that I, I know its point is to delineate the common areas from the homeowners. But given the wooden fences already in place, I'd really prefer to keep the look of an open area in that common space instead. I also sent an email this morning to Jamil and um, one of my other concerns is from a safety perspective. So putting up a, a solid wall of trees with a path behind it so close to our backyards where kids are playing and not being, not having visibility to who might be wandering through the path and stuff like that from a parent's perspective is it's somewhat of a safety concern for us. I think we've, we're all sort of gotten used to having that visibility and seeing the common area and seeing who's gone on the path and to have a wall there literally just feet from where all the kids are playing something I, I think we're not uh, in favor of. So we have not had uh, an official homeowners association meeting because we're not a homeowners association. We have met as a group. I think we had almost everybody in there. Uh, and the general consensus was we're, we're good. Um, obviously, you're taking my word for that because if anyone hasn't replied, but I can't say that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. So again, uh, you know, my, I think my take on this as just one board member is that, again, while I'm not <coughs> wild about the notion of amending past conditions of approval, there are some mitigating circumstances here, and we, there are other means of achieving what I believe to be the underlying, primary underlying goal. 
Um, another thing, just as a, you know, to throw out there is Arbor Vitae, as many of you know, and it's too bad we don't have Ms. Auglis here because she's our yeah. resident landscaping expert, but it grows extremely fast and can be fairly high maintenance. Um, and again, I don't remember verbatim what the deliberation was at the time, uh, settling on Arbor Vitae, but um, it's just one more, one more factor out there. So I personally think I can get reasonably comfortable with that. Um, similarly, on, on the third item, which is on sort of keeping the, uh, the amenities to more of a conceptual level, I'm okay with that. Um, again, in my personal experience, you know, based on more than 10 years on this board, I think it's actually pretty unusual for there to be specific recreational activities <coughs> listed in a plan, um, in, an, in an approved plan. So to me, as long as there's the opportunity for an HOA or whatever um, entity to decide how they want to utilize that area, I don't think it's, I don't think we need to get too far into the weeds on that, so to speak. So um, that's where I am. Um, we do have a draft motion that was prepared for everyone's consideration, and I'm prepared to put that forward. Can I just jump in? Yes, Jamal. Sorry. Um, the, I just wanted to make a note that the in fee request does require a, its, own, its own board vote. Okay. And approval. All right. And sorry, we don't, to, sorry to interrupt. That's, that's quite all right. Uh, and we don't have a motion for that. Correct. Right. We just, so um, I guess we can get the, what we know to be fairly non-controversial item out of the way first. Um, move to approve the request of uh, Sawgrass Subdivision to pay the in-lieu fee of $20,000 rather than providing the affordable housing unit as originally approved. Second. You have a second? Any discussion on that? All in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. Uh, and now I will put forward the other motion. I move to approve the project titled Sawgrass Subdivision Second Amendment proposed by Star Homes, Inc. as depicted on the plan set prepared by BH2M dated June 2018. Do we have a specific date on that? We can amend that as, as needed. I don't think it had a date. Okay. That's why, yeah, it just said June 2018. All right. These amendments include a modification to the approach for an affordable housing unit as well as modifications to the details on sheet nine related to the buffering between individual lots and the village green space. The following condition. Prior to the release of the Mylar, a revised sheet nine shall be provided to the planning department for review and approval. Second. We have a second. Is there any further discussion on this? All in favor? Uh, are you? Opposed. Okay. So, second. Four in favor, one opposed. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Good luck. The next item. Mm -hmm. Main Life Care requests a sketch plan review of 5 Dorado Drive, Assessor's Map, R94, Lot 1D. Janelle? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, the applicant's here for a contract zone amendment uh, sketch plan tonight, so a high-level review from the board uh, for a proposal for a sketch plan for a contract zone amendment to the existing Piper Shores Continuing Care Retirement Community located off of Spurwink Road, off of Dorado Drive. Now the Town Council held their first reading of the proposed fifth contract zone amendment in June 2018, so last month. As many of the planning, as many of you board members know, the contract zone amendment process involves a two-step review process. Subsequent to the sketch plan review, the applicant would be required to re receive preliminary pr provisional site plan approval. Um, and the applicant will need to receive final site plan approval as well but for the contract zone amendment from the planning board following the council's second reading of the amendment. So tonight's just a basic uh, sketch plan review, like I said. Uh, just a little information about the project. The applicant's proposing a new community CCRC, I'll call it, off of Dorado Drive to include eight cottages, 16 duplexes, and 24 to 28 apartment units. Uh, tonight, they've provided the board with a conceptual sketch plan uh, behind me and on the TV screens uh, for the review tonight. So given that the neighborhood is a single-family residential 
in nature. Uh, the applicant is encouraged to provide robust buffering along the property's boundaries. The applicant is always also encouraged to provide a pedestrian connection from the site to the existing Piper Shores property along Piper Road. Uh, the applicant also indicated that the existing recreation trails on the site will remain uh, open to the public. So uh, the board should be sure to discuss uh, their plans and how they plan to keep these, the trails open to the public and how the public will access the trails tonight. <coughs> and then finally, it also appears that a wetland delineation and vernal pool assessment will need to be completed on the site as well. Didn't see one in the materials, and that's all I have. Thanks, Jamil. Um, and I'd just like to just quickly sort of reiterate the notion that, um, as Jamel noted in, in the staff memo, this sketch plan review is not, strictly speaking, a, a required uh, portion of the review process at this, at this point, but given where the applicant is with the council and the contract zone process, uh, they have elected to come here and, and get some high-level feedback from us and let us hear their, um, their general thoughts, and I'm sure we'll come away with some, uh, some next steps. So with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Will Conway from Sebago Technic. And Jamel, can I request control of the uh, screen? Yes, sir. Are you plugged in? Yes. Hopefully it works. Let's hope so. Maybe unplug and plug back in. We'll get my expert up here. No, okay. <laughs> She'll help out here. It always works when nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Looks like you got one off. Looks promising. Hey. Thank you for your patience. Um, we're here tonight to talk about an important project for the Piper Shores community. Um, you may be wondering <clears throat> why the um, applicant is proposing to develop a new property. And the reason uh, is really twofold. The, uh, most of the property on the ocean side of Spurwink Road where, where they can be built, where you can build on that property has been built. Uh, when that contract zone existing was originally um, approved, uh, a majority of that parcel was placed in a conservation easement. So there really is no room for additional expansion uh, on the existing campus. And there's quite a need, uh, the, because many of you may know the quality of this facility they have a waiting list of over 150 people uh, that want to be, become part of the community, but there's presently nowhere to put them. So that's the impetus for the project. And um, we're going to show you a, a master plan in a minute. Um, Jamel mentioned there's three housing types. There are uh, single family cottages, there are duplexes. And then there are what's called hybrid apartments, which is an innovative uh, housing type uh, that we'll explain to you a little bit further. So looking on the screen behind you, so this right here is uh, Spurwink Road. This is Piper Drive. The existing um, main campus is here and uh, some uh, cottage units along this area here. The Dorado property is uh, this open field, and then it sort of zigzags back into this wooded area. So the distance from the entrance to the existing community to the new community is about 150 feet. So it's very close by. And people will travel back and forth, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit. Uh, so somebody living in the existing facility would have reason to go here and vice versa. And this is a little bit dark, but this is the uh, an aerial photograph of the property. Again, Spurwink Road here, existing Piper Shores driveway here. Um, and then it's about uh, 45 acres. It contains one single family home. 
This is a map of the existing conditions on the property. Um, again, to orient you, this is Spurwink Road. Very important, and you'll see it, it, it uh, is sort of brought through our ma master plan, is there's currently a ridge line here that's parallel to Spurwink Road and about 20 feet higher in elevation than Spurwink Road. Behind that, it drops down to sort of an open area. It's absolutely gorgeous, this site. Um, the existing homeowner who lives here uh, maintains this area. It, it's like a, a hidden meadow that's really pretty. And then in the back, uh, this is a wooded parcel uh, here, and then there's an existing pond on the adjacent property. Um, uh, Jamal mentioned wetlands and vernal pools. Uh, we've done a uh, wetland delineation and vernal pool study. We did not find any vernal pools. The wetlands are shown sort of in this uh, color here. And we've met with the main DEP um, as part of our due diligence, um, and they were supportive of our master plan. They encouraged us to, wherever possible, minimize uh, impacts on wetland, which we will do. So this is the master plan, and again, Spurwink Road, this is that ridge line. We're proposing to leave this area undisturbed. The current setbacks in this zone are 50 foot front yards and 15 feet side yards. We're proposing to increase uh, the setback from Spurwink Road to 200, so that'll be a dedicated no-build area, preserving uh, the, the visual uh, character of the Spurwink Road corridor. And then um, this <coughs> is the what we call the pocket neighborhood. There are eight buildings, there are duplex units, uh, there's 16 units here. And then in the wooded area, there are eight single family uh, cottage units in this location. And then the hybrid uh, apartments in this area we're proposing, we're not sure yet, but 24 to 28 units in that building there. And it also has a central sort of clubhouse area that'll have a, um, it'll have a theater in it, a dining room, fitness rooms for the residents, not only for the people in this community, but also uh, people from the existing campus could come over and utilize that amenity. Um, I mentioned the 50-foot um, the buffers, which were, have written into the contract. So there'll be a minimum 50-foot perimeter buffer uh, established. And most of it's vegetated except for right here along uh, Newcomb Ridge Road. And we're going to propose a, a very vigorous, robust landscape buffer in that area here. In the beautiful part of the site called the Meadows, we've retained that as an open space central to the project. And um, so that'll remain um, sort of in its natural state. We will be adding a stormwater pond, which will have a permanent uh, pool, so it'll appear much like the existing pond in this area, and it'll occur sort of at the low point of the property here. Uh, the access drive will come in like this. It goes around the perimeter of these buildings and then terminates here. In this location will be a, a maintenance building which is more than likely will, um, in, in addition to the existing residents on the property, there's an existing barn, and we're thinking about relocating it here for a maintenance uh, facility. Also at this location will be a public trailhead. And we've written into the contract that um, the public would have access through the site to this parking area, and then to a trail system that connects to Camp Ketcha and the Scarborough Land Trust. And most of those trails are on the periphery, periphery of the property within the 50-foot uh, protective buffer. So this is the pocket neighborhood. And again, it's, as planners, I think you can appreciate this is a very innovative uh, plan for housing. You'll note that the, all of the vehicles occur on the perimeter of, the, of the, uh, the, the pocket, we call it. So 
So access to garages would occur off of that. There's a central alleyway here to access these four buildings. <clears throat> and then, so the front doors occur here, and then they open out onto these green spaces, which are connected to that big meadow. And uh, there'll be small garden pavilions in there, so it promotes a uh, active exterior lifestyle for the residents. These are the estate units in the rear of the property. Uh, there are eight buildings. And again, access is similar on the perimeter. Here, there's another alleyway here on the perimeter. perimeter. And then two uh, green spaces there. So the front doors of these buildings would occur adjacent uh, to those spaces. And again, there'll be gardens uh, with pavilions in those areas. This is the hybrid uh, apartments, and I mentioned the central clubhouse here, which is located in sort of this orange color. It's central to the building. And then the two purple wings will be uh, the units. And this, our plan for this building is to park underneath it. So that it'll be a three-story building, um, and then it'll be sort of built into the grade. So the elevation here would be one story above the elevation there and the, the uh, parking would be concealed under the building. This parking would be used for uh, guests, people from um, predominantly from the other campus most likely, but some people may choose to drive or stop here on their way in, stop for dinner, and then go back to their units. And um, so this is a housing type that there isn't anything like this in Maine, and we think all of the housing that's being proposed here is very innovative and creative. This is a section view through the property from Spurwink Road. Again, it shows the, uh, the, the berm that rises up against, um, uh, from Spurwink up to this high point. Then it drops back down. And then this is the hybrid building <coughs> here. It's hard to see, but there's a yellow line on this diagram, so the view from a car here gets deflected almost entirely. You see maybe a two or three feet of the ridge line of that building. And then this uh, in indicates the view I'm going to show you in a minute, taken from Spurway. And again, it shows the road coming up to the crest of the hill. This is the pocket neighborhood on the left, and you can barely see the uh, gable ends of the, of the hybrid building uh, in the rear. Um, there's several community benefits to it. This uh, slide uh, just highlights a couple of them. The tax revenue from this project will be considerable. It'll be uh, age-restricted, 62 and older, so it'll have very lo low impact on schools and other town services. It provides um, a public benefit, access to the walking trails. Also, for the people that live there and the people that visit there, it really is a, introduces an innovative uh, housing community in Scarborough, which presently <laughs> there isn't anything like that, uh, what, what I've shown you tonight uh, in the town. And we thank you. I'm going to conclude here. There are a few things um, in the staff memo that we'd like to discuss with you. But I wanted to let you know that um, there's many partners uh, on the project. Um, you're certainly one of the more important ones as, as you guide us to uh, our ultimate plan. But I mentioned the main DEP. Uh, we've also met with the neighbors on more than one occasion. <coughs> They've expressed concerns with buffers and lighting, which we'll address in our uh, preliminary plan. We'll, and our dialogue with those folks is not over, it's ongoing. We'll continue to meet with them uh, throughout the process. And then <coughs> the town council as well. Uh, they still have a role as we look forward to the process. So the reason that we're here tonight is, as you know, our next step is to file a pr 
preliminary plan, which is, in, our, in my world, that's 90% design drawing, fully stormwater, <coughs> landscaping, lighting, all those things, architecture. So before we embark on that process, we'd like to hear from you and any guidance you could give us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'll just quickly note that um, along those lines, if and when that actual site site plan uh, is, fi is, is uh, filed for review and potential approval, there will be all the usual steps that we go through uh, with, those, with that process, including opportunities for public comment. So I just want to emphasize this is very sort of conceptual at this stage. As the applicant described, uh, they're still engaged with the town council and others. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, you know, the community benefits piece really does relate directly to the, uh, to the, the fact that this is a contract zone. <coughs> Things like tax revenues and impacts on the schools are not really under our purview. It's really more for the council to consider. Um, but I think certainly as we're providing general feedback about things like trail connections and other potential benefits and amenities, that's something that should uh, factor into our thinking. So with that, um, we start down here with uh, <coughs> this time. Thank you. Um, I think you're right on target by saying this is innovative. Uh, and uh, I like the concept of the pocket neighborhoods. <coughs> Uh, I do have a question. I'm looking at the map, that one, and it says future development on the back area. Could you add a little to that? Yes. Uh, first of all, there's no definite plans for it. We don't intend to bring that forward with our site plan. <coughs> <coughs> but in the contract, so we're looking here at 48 to 52 units. In our contract, we've asked for a total build-out of no more than 61. So they would occur in that rear portion, and they would be the uh, single-family estate housing types. But again, <coughs> there are no definitive plans at this time. OK. Uh, I, let, let's go back to the concept of the pocket neighborhood, and, and I really do like that. The um, the discussion that we've had with Crossroads, uh, the development on pocket neighborhoods, has focused on <coughs> creating community and um, especially the front porch. And as you set up these, uh, these units, the duplexes uh, and the single family around the green space, I, I would encourage you to look at the sort of design that uh, invites people to sit out on their front porch and uh, call across to their neighbors, not just, uh, not just the trails and the open space, which is good, but really consider what makes a, what makes a community and what makes neighbors. I, I'd like, I guess, just a little more description of the total of the units, the 28 units in the club building. Can you add? You've said it's innovative. Certainly having underground parking is innovative uh, in Scarborough. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I think um, you'll definitely see that when we bring forward the architecture. But um, <coughs> these units are um, highly amenitized, and they will be uh, contiguous with the clubhouse. So <clears throat> if you're in any one of these units, you can walk down the hallway, take an elevator or a stair, and be in one of those common spaces. Right. Um, I would encourage <coughs> you to consider how folks are going to get to and from the other facility. You've, you've suggested that folks would be coming from Piper Shores uh, to use the, the club. I, uh, and for, for some of the <coughs> residents of Piper Shores, walking is not an option, and not, not that distance. Agreed. Uh, I, so um, I guess I would think about uh, the sort of transportation uh, and connection that might be provided between the two of them. I, I understand that that's not necessarily part of the architecture, but it certainly is part of the community. And whatever can be done to bring those two 
two ends of the shores together, I, I think, should uh, be looked at. Thank you. And we have, and I'd just like to elaborate on that, because that's one of the things in the staff report that we disagreed with, which the staff report recommended a pedestrian connection between the two campuses. The nature of these residences are somewhat elderly. Spurwink Road is a busy road. Uh, we don't want our people crossing that road. So the, the, the transportation would be either twofold. For a resident with a car, they could drive or a resident without a car, there'll be shuttles provided by the, by the facility in both directions. All right. Uh, I, like the, I like the design. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the architecture and the, the fulfillment of um, what you're starting to describe here. Uh, I have no more questions. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Yeah, getting back to the pedestrian connection, I, I do believe that's important because we're, it's, it's employees. I mean, the, the number of employees that Piper Shores employs is, is tremendous. And so that pedestrian connection may be more necessary for, for, for uh, employees. And also, um, it is a transitional age community. So if people are able to walk, walk around, they should be encouraged to do so. So I am not inclined to overturn the staff's comments that there should be a pedestrian connection there. Were there any other staff comments that you were sort of objected to, Will, at all? Yes. Um, the, the, the memo uh, asked the applicant or asked you folks to weigh in on a conservation easement over mm -hmm. the trails. Mm -hmm. And um, What page is that on, Will? Um, Second or third? Second page. Second page, third paragraph. Okay. Oh, the trailhead, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple reasons for it. As I pointed out in my presentation, most of these trails occur within the 50-foot undisturbed buffer, so they can't be touched as well. And then the other thing is that uh, a conservation easement, as this applicant has discovered on its existing property, is very onerous. So, for example, to, to your questions, I said they may or may not build a future phase. There's mm -hmm. no definite plan, mm -hmm. but they want to have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. The conservation easement would eliminate that flexibility. Was there any other one that you disagreed with, or is it mainly just that? Uh, the other one that, uh, it, it was a question, so I don't know that I disagree with it, but um, the staff asked if is this a project the board would be inclined to seek a peer review of the wetland delineation? Mm -hmm. And to that I say a couple things. Um, you know that Sebago Technics does a lot of business in this town. We've done hundreds of projects. Mm -hmm. Our wetland de delineation person, his name is Gary Fullerton, he's a registered soil scientist, mm -hmm. enjoys an excellent reputation mm -hmm. with the main DEP and the Army Corps. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I see no reason to do it, and I would ask the board to support me on that request. Right. Any others? No. Okay. Anything else in the staff report? For example, on Seems page one, appropriate. Uh, the second bullet is uh, to add language to the contract ensuring the town's buffering standards mm -hmm. are met. No problem with that. Okay. Um, Another, so in, we've committed to a robust visual buffer along the properties where there are no existing vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have no issue with that. I won't go through every one yeah, of them. Yeah, perfect, thank you. I just really wanted to get to what the outliers might be kind of a thing. Those so, are the three. So, uh, wait, three. Which I got the uh, the wetland review and I got the conservation easement. The and side the third one, one which we know you don't wall. support. Got it. But. Okay, <laughs> so I would also, um, mention that wetland peer reviews are not just about reputation, it's just about the conditions under which they were they, the, the wetlands were happening. And we all, whether we're engineers, scientists, and other, it's, it's important that we have an open, transparent, third-party relationship kind of a thing. So it's not about, it's not about um, your soil scientist's reputation or lack of qualifications, Will. It's really that um, the town of Scarborough is, is we really hold the Scarborough Marsh as our, as our entity. And there is 
um, as, as Susan Oglis has mentioned in the past, all of the all of the proper uh, the uplands properties have already been developed. So a lot of the property that we have left in Scarborough has some wetlands on it, and we need to we need to maintain that to the best of our ability. So it's really not anything about you know your your qualifications and your person your personnel. It's it's really more about just understanding what our natural resources are and also identifying our vernal pools assessment. So so I would would recommend that we have a wetland peer review, especially if we haven't had a wetland review in the last five years, and or if it was done um, within the last five years, we were in a drought in 2016 and 2017, we never really came out of it. And so if it was done in those two years, a lot of that work is, is you know, for lack of a better term, suspect kind of a thing. So that's, that's how I feel about wetlands. Not to be argumentative, mm -hmm. but to just to reiterate our position is, um, First, to your point, it, it was recent. It mm -hmm. was in 2017 mm -hmm. that it was done. And um, this, uh, when I saw that comment, I said, why this project? And Because I've never had a, that request before mm -hmm. in your town. Mm -hmm. So that was two. Third is, you know, as you're aware, a wetland scientist uses the Army Corps method of delineation. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you, if you have five wetland scientists go out to that property, you're going to get five different maps. Absolutely. So let's say you get your person out there, and the map's different. Yeah. So how do we say? And, and I've seen areas too, Will, where the same DEP person goes out to the same site, and they're like, oh, I forgot that. I should put that in. That's a stream, or that's not. So I, I get what you're saying, um, but I stand by. What, what our, about our this as a compromise? What if we commit to having the DEP visit the site? It's not the same. Um, getting to the conservation easement, I think that um, conservation easement is what it is, and I think we need to work within those parameters here. And, and likewise, if we're thinking about any other waivers or requests, we need to think about them now so that it can go in the contract zone amendment. And just to remind folks, contract zoning is it's very much um, a tit-for-tat type of thing where um, you're looking for waivers from and relief from some of our town standards. In re, you know, so in return, we're asking you to, to do things. And, and in this case, I, I completely support the public benefit that this project is bringing, whether it's uh, additional tax base to the town. And, and I don't think there's one person here who, who, who doesn't think that this is a, a wonderful project and will bring public benefit. But I, I want us to do our work up front and let's look at what waivers are needing, whether it's with respect to conservation easement or lighting or anything like that. Let's get it all in the contract zone. We got plenty of time to do that. And so I have a question about the contract zone. Um, I know that the second amendment was put into our packet, and this is the fifth amendment. So I'm just wondering if we can have some background information in the meantime about what the third and the fourth amendment were and what the, the intent of those were in the contract zone amendment kind of a thing. Jamel and I don't want to put you on the spot to talk about it now. Sure, I actually um, am surprised to hear that it was the second amendment that was provided to you. I would actually ask the applicant okay. why that was provided uh, with the application. Um, I'm going to have our attorney address that, please. Okay. okay. Good evening. My name is Charlie Katz Levy. I'm with the law firm of Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry in Portland. And I'm standing in for a colleague of mine, Ron Epstein, who's been the longtime general counsel for Piper Shores and who prepared this amendment. My understanding, based on the title work, is that it is the second amendment. Okay. I have a draft uh, copy of the recorded uh, contract zone agreement and first amendment in my file. Uh, I don't have a second, third, or fourth amendment. Okay. Great. Thank you. I guess that's something we should definitely resolve. Um, and then I guess if, you, if you're just looking for, um, thank you for the frank conversation and the witty repartee, if I might. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, That's why we're here. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I would like to let you know too, and, and I think it's no secret that, you know, um, the priorities that, that I, would, I, I would request as a planning board member is that we do 
put all potential waivers up front into the contract zone amendment. So if, if do all the homework now so that that, can, that information can go into the, in front of the town council and that there's no surprises when we go to do site plan reviews and things like that, because let's just get it all on the table. Um, the other thing I, I, I'm surprised, I, I'd like to hear, I, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that DEP has asked you to minimize impact impacts to wetland. Um, but I would be remiss in, in, in not asking you to also um, honor the natural hydrology of the land, a meadow buffer um, that is a beautiful, beautiful treasure. And the fact that some of it is going to be sort of compromised for the development, but um, sort of the best stormwater treatment you can have is a forested or a meadow buffer. And to have that taken away, I, you know, this brings, comes to my next priority, which is to basically honor all the regulatory triggers when it comes to stormwater management, Army Corps, wetland permits, that types of thing. Because we are looking at a larger common plan of development here, which, which um, as you know, you know, trigger site law and so many other things when you look at it in that way. And so I would ask that we honor all those triggers. And as we do that, really think about that natural hydrology and how we can promote low impact development and green infrastructure to maintain the natural hydrology to the maximum extent practical. And I'm done. Thanks. I would just like to jump in yeah. and admit an error. It is the Second Amendment and that was a staff uh, error. So Perfect, thank my, you. My apologies right. for that. Good, thank you. Right. you use the error. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Nick? Well, I'm going to quickly piggyback. I do recall, and I think a lot of the members here were on the board when Piper Shores came to us for an expansion of their existing housing. Wasn't that an amendment to the contract zone, or was that just an amendment to the site plan? Anyways, I'll let you guys sort that out at a different time. I believe it would have been the first amendment. The second amendment. So this I recall that as well. Yep. So, <clears throat> thank you. Sorry about that, guys. Um, all right, so uh, let's go to the conservation easement real quick. Um, so it occurs to me that if you leave this labeled as potential future development, what you're claiming currently as a public benefit for the community, which is access to trailways, et cetera, open space, et cetera, is going to be demolished by your future development. So no. I don't know how you get across that trail yeah. with new, with, without you know, impacting what's currently there for people to enjoy. So looking at this diagram, yeah. the majority of the trails occur in this 50-foot undisturbed buffer. The trailhead is in the center of the property, so there will be connections required. So there may be a, um, a road crossing uh, from the parking lot to this side. But other than that, uh, none of the trails will be disturbed by, by this development, if it occurs. What's that big trail going right down the center of the property, though? Is it, that looks to me like that's to go to Camp Ketcha or some other land trust. Is that what's on the other side of that? Um, I, just, I just want to, I think I can potentially, uh, if I may, try and address the board's concern uh, in a way that that I hope would be satisfactory. Um, I think the applicant's con uh, concern with the conservation easement has more to do with the uh, expense and um, also challenges of bringing in a third party and the monitoring and some of the other aspects that go on with the conservation easement process. It's not with perpetual conservation of trail areas. And there are other ways to accomplish that with deed restrictions, a declaration of restrictive covenants. And so uh, the applicant is open to the idea of not only perpetual conservation in the buffer areas, but potentially additional perpetual conservation of trail areas through a recorded declaration of government covenants or other instrument in the registry of deeds that would be something that would have less um, complexity and um, third party uh, who would have to hold the conservation easement and monitor the easement and so forth. I don't know if that um, addresses the underlying concern about perpetual uh, protection of the uh, trails. Well, I think the easier way would be to deed it over to the land trust. Mm -hmm. That would wipe your hands totally, completely clean of any type of service you may have to do on that part of the property. But it still doesn't answer my question as to 
you develop out here? Aren't you, in fact, going to put a road crossing across part of that trail system and then part of the land which people might be out there enjoying currently? I mean, it, and you've listed that as a benefit to the community. That's, that's where I'm going with this, is, which is don't list it to me as a benefit now for this community and then all of a sudden, five years from now, when you decide you need more housing, it's gone. Because yeah. that's not a benefit to the community. Mm -hmm. It's a benefit to the community for five years, mm -hmm. but not for year six, seven, and eight and beyond. So that would be my, my big concern regarding this conservation Well, discussion. you use the word gone, which is not accurate. There, 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 might be some, there, there might be some impact to a trail right in the area of the road, but that would be it. All these other trails would be untouched. And as our attorney mentioned, we'd be willing to yeah, provide a permanent measure of guaranteeing that. If I could, Nick, is your concern about the trail, trail access, and that un, unimproved land that? Yeah, I think it's and, and it, <clears throat> possible benefits of the land itself. Specifically, this I mean, unless I'm wrong, is that a trail? Yes. And so I, your road's going to extend into here to develop it, right? So you will have trail that is being destroyed, and then on, on top of it, land that people might be enjoying currently. And that's a listed, it's what you have as a listed benefit to this community. That, that's part of my concern about what you're proposing. So I don't know if that helped clarify it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful piece of land. I can see why you want to do this. Um, I, I got to believe there's a solution there. And I just don't want to accept that this is what, and I know this is a very early on iteration of this plan. But please take the comments to heart that we would like to see something a little bit more secure. Um, for the community. We will certainly first. consider it. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, outside of that, let's see what we got. Um, I, I have a question on your narrative real quick, and I'm going to bring you away to the, the start of this discussion. Sorry. Um, it says, Piper Shores has opted to amend the existing contract zone agreement rather than seek a new contract zone agreement for the site. But you didn't really tell us why. Is there a reason why, because what I see here is two separate clubhouses, uh, no desire to connect it through a pedestrian walkway. Um, why aren't these two separate developments? I understand the owner could be the same. Um, but why did you not seek a separate contract zone well, for this and why not? Well, it was at, at the advice of your town manager and planning director that we approached it this way, and the council was supportive of it. Furthermore, when DEP reviews this uh, project, they'll review it all as one. So it's just more consistent throughout all of the permitting to do it that way. So more hurdle-wise, it's easier to get the amendment <clears throat> than to start. No, it's not. I mean, you could, you could deny this amendment. It, it doesn't make it any easier. It's, it's a, uh, a process that was uh, recommended to us by Tom and Jay. And we said, yes, sir, and yes, sir. That's how we'll approach it. <laughs> I believe that was opposed to rezoning, though, correct? And maybe Karen can speak to that. Is that no? <laughs> We're getting the heavy hitters up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. Hello, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Jim Adamovich. I'm CEO of Maine Life Care Retirement Community doing business as Piper Shores. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present our prospective project to the board tonight. Um, I'd like to try to address some of the comments that have been um, issued recently, and specifically the concern about should we be seeking uh, an independent contract zoning agreement on this parcel. I think part of the counsel that we received in the dialogue that we've had with town officials is that the mission of Piper Shores is to provide retirement living services for the organization. This, uh, this project that is being proposed is really an extension of our primary mission to serve seniors. Related to that, this project uh, and the Dorado site is not meant to be replicating everything that we offer at 15 Piper Road across the street. It is to augment and to complement that which already exists. So by way of example, 
There will be no health services delivered uh, on an inpatient basis on this, on this parcel. We will leverage the existing skilled nursing facility and assisted living facilities that are part of the 15 Piper Road campus. We are not going to replicate and repeat the development of all of the other infrastructure services. For example, we will have a modest fitness center proposed as part of this clubhouse space. We will not build a swimming pool, which is on the existing campus. And there's a whole host of other programs and amenities that we are not going to be duplicating on this parcel, but really this is meant to complement the existing services and amenities that um, are present at 15 Piper Road. So that was the rationale in looking to extend the contract zone through an amendment, a second amendment, as opposed to seeking um, a new contract zone. I hope I was able to respond to your question adequately. If I may also take the liberty to talk a little bit about the conservation easement. Um, Will did cite in his opening remarks that Piper Shores has made um, a significant commitment to uh, conservation and um, by way of a conservation easement. The existing property of Piper Shores is 138 acres. Of those acres, 96 are in permanent con uh, conservation, which means more than three quarters of the acreage of the existing campus is really going to remain in its pristine condition, which includes walking trails and a significant uh, amount of wetlands. Um, we believe that as an organization, that's a major commitment to good stewardship of the land. Um, the reality is, is if there were additional acres on the Piper Shores campus that would enable us to build some additional independent living, we would not be here this evening to talk to you about the Dorado property. Given the fact that the campus, um, with 200 units of independent housing and 90 units of health services, is all uh, but built out on its current site, and that continuing demand and growing demand for retirement living services, we really felt compelled to be able to, to find another parcel. And we wanted to look as close as possible to the Piper Shores community so that we could leverage the existing amenities and features of the primary campus and not have to take more green space in building um, duplicative kinds of facilities and services. So we're really trying in the process of this initiative to be good stewards of the land, to represent that the walking trails are an important part of the existing Piper Shores campus where we have Scarborough residents walking the property every day. We would like to extend that opportunity um, on the Dorado property. I think we could work out a solution whereby the walking trail that bisects that last um, area of the property could be addressed either through the development of some addition, additional trails or modifying the route of the trails. I think we can address the access to the Camp Catch a parcel where we have already established a really good working relationship and wish to extend that relationship by, by way of this development. Lastly, I think um, by providing that community benefit of the walking trails through the property, we would also be able to leverage the 100 plus acres of the Scarborough Land Trust that sits behind this area through both the camp and really opening up to the residents of Scarborough and beyond some really great natural benefits that without the development uh, of this project, um, may lock out a, a, a good amount of the use of both this property as well as the camp and the land trust parcel. I'd be happy to entertain any questions if you had any for me, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as the rest of my questions, I don't, I don't really have anything that hasn't been done yet. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, I um, I'm not um, unlike my other my colleagues. I'm I'm not too concerned about the conservation easement because 
if anything were to be done with that piece of property, that would be another amendment coming before us, I would assume, another contract zone amendment. Correct. And we could deal with it at that point. Um, so I'm not too concerned. Um, I see this, I, I, I agree with what the gentleman just stated. I see this as an extension of the cottages, more or less, on the other side of the road. And this is almost like a satellite type operation. Um, I, I think it looks terrific myself. Um, I'm not concerned about that trail. Um, we put a little traffic cop right there and take care of that. Um, the, the, the situation regarding uh, connection between the two properties, um, I also question about the wisdom of having a sidewalk there. Um, I think you probably use your shuttle or something like that, whether it's employees or you know, residents who want to get back and forth. Um, so I, you know, that's a that's a pretty busy, busy street there, and I'm not sure too many. I, re, that's a long walk even for employees if they if they're working over there and they want to come over <coughs> to another place. That's going to be a long, long, long walk. Um, I have a question regarding the trails, though. Um, you mentioned um, uh, there's been mentioned about the the public using the trails. I've been on the main property, and I don't recall seeing any kind of signage. Is there, is there any signage that indicates to the public that there's trails, walkable trails? And, and on the existing property, I'm not sure where there's any kind of a trail, trail ahead. I noticed on this plan there is, which is a good thing. Um, so maybe, maybe that would be one benefit. I'm, maybe there's signage there, and I've just never seen we, it. We will propose signage. You know, even on the existing property, I'm not sure I've ever seen any signage. Is this I understand? Um, your question regarding signage, to the best of my knowledge, there is no signage, and I'm looking to one of our Piper Shores residents who may or may not be able to help us, but I don't believe we do have any existing signage on the property. Um, we have, gosh, uh, a pretty extensive trail network, including some um, boardwalks that have been built through some of the wet areas for access to the property. But there is no map that I know on the site, but I think that's a, a very good comment and we would certainly look to add that. I think it would be of value to the, the residents of the town of Scarborough. Yeah. I, I seem to recall that was a big issue with the original development, that uh, the public have access to that property. You know, and and I, I don't expect you to want a swarm of people coming <laughs> down here, but I mean, just to have it there. Yeah. I, I would say in general now, we're, we're next month will be 17 years that Piper Shores has been opened, and um, the public uses the community for walking purposes. We have a number of residents, Scarborough residents, that use the property to run, to exercise, to walk their dogs. Etc. And I think it's being well used by the public. It's not overrun in any way, shape, or form. But I think there's a really nice balance um, in terms of the use of the, the, the property. We would envision the very same thing on the Dorado property. Um, I think opening up the access to that back portion of Camp Ketcha would be delightful for the public in general. And I think uh, we could enhance the access to some of these really beautiful lands um, by way of the Dorado property. Um, while you're there, I, I, I just want to bring up something. I seem to recall there was, a, um, there was an effort on, on the, uh, your part to break the conservation easement, the existing one, across the street from Piper Road because yes. you wanted to put in a community center or something like that a few years ago? Um, about three years ago when we came forward to the town for the first amendment to the contract zone, we had also presented some broad master planning, frankly about the future development or the possibility of developing some independent living on the existing parcel. It was clear based upon the reception that we received, I, I think from this board as well as other comments at town council, that the prospect of unwinding any portion of the conservation easement, even with a multiplier 
donation of other acreage in town was something that was not well regarded. And that's really what compelled us to look outside of our existing property to be able to try to identify um, the possibility of garnering some acreage to develop independent living. Sure. Um, I think that's all I have. I, I, I think it looks, uh, I, I think it looks terrific, so um, I don't have anything more. Right. Thanks, Roger. Um, as is often the case, going last, I, there's not a whole lot of new ground to cover. Um, but just to quickly piggyback on the, the conservation topic, I'm glad to hear that there's a willingness, clearly a genuine willingness on the part of the applicant to come up with some, some approach that will uh, provide some long-term memorialized conservation um, of, the, of the trail network, whether it's, whether it's a, an easement per se or not. I appreciate that. Um, and um, in terms of the pedestrian, any pedestrian connection, um, I, would, I would personally ask that, that you reconsider that or continue to consider that at least um, don't close the door on it and, and leave it open as a possibility. I understand there are always safety concerns and that you know we're talking about sort of different populations here. Um, but I'd hate to see a potential pedestrian connection and some of the benefits that could bring. Um, uh, I'd hate to see that dismissed as a possibility and I think there are ways to mitigate the safety risk and the property can presumably regulate some of that um, with its own residents and employees. Um, but I think, uh, I think that's something that should, should definitely still be on the table. Um, as was mentioned, uh, stormwater is going to be very important here. Um, and you know, somewhat related to that on the wetlands topic, um, I also would be in favor of a peer review. And again, as Ms. Saunders said, it's really it's not about second guessing anyone. Um, it's really it's something that we we have we we have been doing increasingly, uh, particularly with these types of projects where we're talking about you know fairly high impact uh, projects in pretty sensitive environmental areas. Um, in this case, kind of sandwiched between the marsh and the, the ocean. And if anyone's paid, you know, followed any of the recent discussions around the, the proposed cell tower down at Proud's Neck, um, you know, it's a hot button issue, and, and um, it's something we value all around town. But I think, you know, in, in, with this type of site, it's really the way I think about it anyway. And I think the way the board generally thinks about it, and the staff as well, is it's more kind of just extra due diligence, and it's not meant to be. Uh, any sort of onerous additional burden or, or anything like that. But you know, also here, given that this is um, part of a contract zone process, I think you get that when, you know, once you open that door, you know, there, there are a lot of things that um, sometimes some extra hoops to jump through. And again, that's not to suggest that we're just throwing things out there arbitrarily. It's really wanting to just make sure that we, um, we have a well-rounded, comprehensive sense of things. Um, and um, I'd also urge you to continue with the neighborhood outreach, make sure that all the abutters have, are, have been contacted and, and are in the loop. And that's a process that will obviously continue. And as I said earlier, at least I think I said earlier, if and when this does get to the point where we're doing a site plan review, there will be a whole new process there that includes uh, public comment and, and everything else. Um, and then finally, I can't let this go. This came up on the, you know, the last time that we <laughs> We heard someone on a proposed contract zone, and it's something that gets thrown in often on the laundry list of supposed benefits to the town, and that's you know little or no impact on the schools. And I just I can't help but just put in my two cents to say I, I always hate to see the schools singled out as um, you know a, sort of a presumed special burden on the town. Um, I, I think common sense says that you're not going to be adding school kids with what you're proposing here, but I just don't like to hear the, the school population listed as um, a benefit to the town. So um, with that, I think that's all been covered pretty well. I don't think I need to belabor things. Is there any other feedback that you'd appreciate from us at this point before you go back? No, thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you in October. All right, thank you.
things turn over here a little bit. Next item, Mark and Beth O'Leary request a sketch plan review for a residential subdivision at 98 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map, R59, Lot 8C. Jamal? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, similarly, a sawgrass subdivision. This is in the VR4 zoning district, as you said, at 98 Sawyer Road. It's a parcel that uh, has been logged over the last several years. Just trying to tell you guys where, where you can find it. Um, Proposal is for a sketch plan review tonight of a proposed uh, subdivision including 92 uh, residential units. So it's pretty significant. Um, the VR4 zoning district standards are intended to promote the establishment of a higher density village style development with interconnected network of landscape streets, blocks, and pedestrian ways. The zoning ordinance has some unique standards that uh, many of our other zoning ordinances do not have. Um, so in order to meet these standards, this Several suggestions here. The applicant should design the development with a pattern of primarily rectangular blocks forming a grid layout and connected streets. Allocate at least 10% of the net residential acreage as village green open space to be used for recreational purposes. Design the development to be clustered away from wetlands and other water bodies to minimize those impacts. And provide connections to abutting properties for future pedestrian and or vehicular access. Uh, the zoning standards also require the applicant to provide sidewalks throughout the development that connect, that also connect to pedestrian amenities of the abutting neighborhoods. Uh, to this end, the board should have a discussion with the applicant about providing a sidewalk along Sawyer Road that connects, that connects to the existing sidewalks in the area. This would help to provide a sidewalk connection from Route 1 to Gorham Road, which is one of the primary objectives of the town's Oak Hill pedestrian plan. The applicant has indicated they will be servicing the project with public sewer via new sewer line extension. Uh, I think the board would be interested in hearing about that. A um, few more comments. Staff would also like to note that it looks like a tributary of the Mill Brook uh, runs through the property. Um, just to remind the board and the applicant that Mill Brook is on Maine DEP's threatened watersheds list, so additional measures should be taken to minimize impacts to the stream and watershed. It appears that the northeasterly portion of the property abuts land owned by the Scarborough Land Trust. Uh, the applicant should discuss with the board their plans to coordinate with the land trust with this uh, open space and create some contiguous open space. And then finally, the applicant is planning on constructing, what well, sounds like uh, constructing a transmission tower within the northern portion of the property. Uh, sounds like the applicant's requesting a waiver from the 25 acre minimum lot size standard found in the zoning ordinance. However, the minimum lot size can only be re reduced to a minimum of five acres by the planning board only after a transmission tower has been approved and installed on the site. Just wanted to remind the board of that, and that's what I have. Thanks, Jamel. And I will uh, hand it off to the applicant. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and planning board members. My name is Steve Bradstreet with Ransom Consulting. Uh, with me tonight is Mark O'Leary, uh, the applicant. Um, Besides just the narrative that uh, was just given and what we submitted, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of um, where this is uh, located um, and some of the other history behind it. It's at 98 Sawyer Street, which is approximately 2,000 or so feet from the Gorham Road, um, down Sawyer Road, right before you take the, uh, where it bears to the southwest. Uh, um, the layout of what you have for a sketch plan uh, on the screen tonight that was submitted to you uh, two weeks ago uh, was provided by uh, Steve Ross, uh, uh, professional land surveyor. The wetland delineation and vernal pool assessment was prepared this year uh, and was done by uh, Dale Brewer, uh, who is a certified uh, soil scientist. The traffic study, which was not part of your package, but I will speak to tonight, uh, was uh, done by, prepared by Bill Bray, and uh, was actually received uh, this morning uh, via email from Bill. Um, the project is in the Village Residential 4 Zoning District. Um, as uh, indicated, we're looking at 92 residential units 
on this uh, piece of property. Uh, there were actually uh, two parcels, 11 uh, uh, acres up front and an additional uh, in the uh, back. But the 64 single family homes, that is split possibly half and half with uh, one bedroom, two bedroom uh, apart, uh, units. Four duplexes, uh, four one bedroom uh, senior cottage rentals, and then 16 apartments. And the 16 apartments are eight one bedroom units and eight two bedroom units. Um, based on what you see in this layout uh, uh, in front of you, there is approximately 3,000 uh, feet of internal roads. There is public water that has been, uh, well, that's in Sawyer Road, but also has been stubbed into the property via an eight inch uh, water main that has been stubbed into the entrance already. Uh, so that uh, is there. The, as uh, mentioned, the public, what we're pr uh, presenting tonight is a public sewer. It's a low pressure force main. The parcel out there, uh, varies in elevation of maybe approximately five feet. Uh, very difficult to get gravity sewer and pump stations uh, in that type of uh, land terrain. So what we're looking at is a low pressure force main system with internal to the subdivision and then extended out to the Gorham Road. Um, that low pressure force main has already been designed, uh, FR Mahaney, uh, using the E1 system, uh, provided the design for us brought it all the way out on Sawyer Road, all the way up to Gorham Road. We have met with the sanitary uh, district and received on July 6th a letter from uh, David Hughes uh, that indicated that the, uh, their board has approved connection to the sanitary system out in Gorham Road. Now, if you know or recall, there are two sanitary systems out in Gorham Road. There's one that there is a force main that comes from the west to a terminus manhole on the south side of uh, Gorham Road, and then there is a smaller gravity system that is on the north side of Gorham Road, roughly in the same location, manholes a little further east towards Oak Hill. That is the one that we're tying into. The other one um, does not have the capacity, or questionable capacity. The other one, the sanitary uh, district has determined that there is capacity in uh, that system. So we would be coming along Sawyer Road on the north side, uh, excuse me, on the west side of Sawyer Road to Gorham Road, cross Gorham Road, head east and tie into that uh, structure. That structure is approximately 100, 125 feet down Sawyer Road. So the reason that we actually initiated discussions with the sanitary uh, district up front and early is that um, we need to be able to get their buy-in to be able to do that and then also get the survey, design it, because their approval obviously hinges on a design plan. Um, and so what they have approved is us to be able to get into Groham Road and out onto Sawyer Road prior to the upcoming construction that is going to occur this fall or late August or whatever. So we're trying to get ahead of that as much as we can. Uh, so the force main will be on the um, west side of Sawyer Road connecting out there. We have already, um, and it was not in your package, the July 6th the letter um, from the uh, sanitary district, but we do have that, uh, that the board has approved that we uh, make, can make that connection. The um, lots, as you look at the plan, the lots are approximately all 6,000 square feet. Um, there are individual lots that are uh, larger, and those are because they uh, will have the uh, duplexes on it, uh, the apartments on it, or the senior cottage uh, rentals on it. That's why some of those are a different larger size. Uh, obviously, corner lots or other lots that are close to uh, wetlands um, are of different sizes, uh, but Primarily, these are all uh, approximately 6,000 square feet in size. As mentioned, uh, the applicant is uh, considering a tower on the back portion of the uh, property and um, was looking uh, and is looking for that uh, uh, 
waiver of the 25 acres, understanding that once constructed, it could be uh, approached and reduced, petition to be reduced to the five acres. That is still uh, a point of discussion that we'd like to have with the, uh, the planning board and with the town in regards to that and how we can proceed uh, moving forward on that. Um, also, that was not in the uh, application, not in the narrative. Um, 6,000 square feet, square foot lots, um, 1,200 foot uh, square foot apartments, um, cottages, or anything that small, very limited storage space. So there is a uh, potential of a facility on there with additional storage uh, for uh, residents that desire, uh, instead of storing it on their own property, if they don't have it, be able to uh, provide a facility to do that for residents only. It's not public. Um, what was uh, noted was the Scarborough Land Conservation Trust, which is a, a large parcel to the west behind um, this uh, subdivision. Uh, the applicant is uh, looking to provide access to it from their road network. Uh, parking, also public parking uh, to that property. Uh, and the property is actually theirs, that they are looking at donating to the land trust and uh, approximately seven acres, uh, six acres, excuse me, approximately six acres in size. Um, so that is part of the uh, open space requirement that we're trying to uh, work into this uh, project. Uh, rather than specifically with this plan, individual open space areas, but providing uh, a large portion of land that has a trail system through it currently, providing public access, public parking, uh, and donating that uh, land to the trust. The applicant is also looking at um, uh, donating up to uh, four lots for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, that depends on a lot of things and discussions with the board on how that works into additional lots that we may be able to uh, pick up based on lots that are being donated uh, to the Habitat for the Community, uh, but that is something that is in your package. We don't know where they are on site at this time, but that's something that we'd uh, uh, like to discuss with you. The waiver that we asked for sidewalks, uh, that was intended to be, uh, the uh, requirement was sidewalks on both sides. We're looking at a waiver of sidewalks on both sides to a sidewalk on one side. Uh, that's just sort of a clarification. Uh, that was not clear in the uh, narrative um, that we uh, provided. Um, as I had noted, uh, Bill Bray is our traffic engineer, uh, and he provided the uh, report this, this morning. And I just wanted to highlight three things on there primarily that are uh, of the primary interest. Sawyer Road uh, intersects US Route 1, um, and that intersection currently has an existing level of service of A. Uh, with the new development, it continues as a level of service A. It does not change. The Sawyer Road, Gorham Road intersection currently is at a level of service C. Um, with the proposed uh, development, based on the calculations that Bill provided, um, would be a level of service C slash D. It's borderline. It's 26 seconds as a delay. 25 seconds is a level C. He said it's right on the borderline. But in discussion with the applicant and um, what we have for the single family homes as being two bedroom or one bedroom, uh, if it's split two or three, I'm sorry, I think I spoke one to two bedrooms earlier, two to three, if it was split differently, we believe that level of service does not change at uh, Sawyer Road, um, at Gorm Road. Um, he also checked the site distances out there, and I think that's all, also a, a critical factor. It's a 35 mile an hour zone, requires 305 feet of site distance, and we will exceed that in both the right and left uh, direction as you uh, exit the site. Um, we haven't looked at it in detail. There's a lot of uh, wetlands on the site that we are um, avoiding or trying to avoid, at least with this plan. 
Um, but uh, stormwater management, uh, obviously water quality, water quantity, how we do this on the site with the topography that we have. We're looking at uh, probably multiple um, control areas for treatment, for quantity. Uh, that would maybe infiltration basins, um, bio uh, filtration uh, areas, and buffers, etc. But we're not looking, there's no one location that we can go to. Uh, it will probably be multiple locations that will have uh, uh, different facilities on site. When you look at the plan and you see the uh, wetlands and then you do see with this sketch plan uh, roads crossing it um, uh, and the like, if you look at all the road locations, we, the alignment of the roads was minimized through the wetlands. We went through the narrowest point of the wetlands. Based on this plan, we were over the 4,300 square feet. Um, so we were into a tier one, we're less than 15,000. But once we received the comments from uh, the town, and in considering that, we have uh, gone back and looked at what can we do to address specifically the, that, along with other things, but specifically uh, that comment. And um, I know that it's, it's late, uh, but, uh, we just emailed to uh, Jamel a new plan that shows the revised uh, plan. It also addresses the rectangular shape of the, uh, the lot layouts and everything. Uh, it is different from this plan, but what we've done is brought all the wetland impact of the roads right of way down below 4,300 square feet. So it's down below a permit by rule for the road impacts. So it, it does look different than what you have up there. Um, it looks better than what you have up there. But we wanted to be able to at least uh, acknowledge your comments, acknowledge that we we're trying to address them in a timely fashion, uh, and that um, I hate to bring anything to the board the night off, but I just wanted them to be, you to be aware of that we are considering that, we are trying to address it, and we just would like to uh, uh, move forward with that. With that said, um, Mark O'Leary uh, is more familiar with exactly what has been revised, and I'd like to have uh, Mark come up and talk to you about that. First of all, on behalf of my wife and myself, we thank you for your considerations um, and the comments you sent back. I missed the mark on the wetlands and the open space on this for your submittal. Um, the plan you have, I don't know if you've seen it, Jamel. I have not. Um, I just sent it to you. I don't know if it's all right to pull it up, but I think it will give a lot of clarification. Typically, the board will review what's been provided. Um, I understand. I didn't know yeah. with it being a sketch plan if I could do that. I can tell you this. 95% of the house lots that are, have wetlands on them now do not. The uplands are out back. Um, we've extended that out. We stayed out of the wetlands. Uh, it added about 300 feet of road on, um, but it created some very unique um, open space areas within the development. The, it gave us a nice egress to the piece of land that we would be donating to the land trust. Um, along with that, there is a strip of land below the land trust land that is 50 by 400 in that there is a nice trail. Uh, it goes out beyond where we're showing the lots on the borderline, and I would wrap that around to come over to the, the far left-hand road so that there was a, a trail uh, system. The, uh, all the lots are set up so that it's a uh, self portland neighborhood. When I had this uh, zone change done, that's what I designed it after. Those were 50 by 100. It's a lot easier to build on a 60 by 100. Um, I have met with a few of the neighbors, uh, in, in, including Craig, and one of the things he addressed was that, who wants to have a, a house that backs up to another one? Well, he'll be pleased to see that it's now minimized. Almost everything is on a uh, outside border, uh, so you're gonna have woods backing up to. 
Um, we've got the connectivity to the uh, property to the west of us. Uh, I would just continue a road straight through um, if that was their wish. I believe that's the only property that you'd be looking at for connectivity. Um, our thought going into this was if we could create something for the land trust, the town would enjoy that uh, with the school system right behind it. Uh, the Habitat for Humanity, uh, we're an insistent <coughs> that uh, we give back right from the start. And those four houses I don't want uh, up to four, depending on how this plays out. I don't want those in one spot. I want those mixed throughout the development. Uh, they would still meet the same kind of standards. Um, the one-bedroom cottages, uh, this is all like a Cape Cod style. Uh, for our preliminary, you'll see some very nice sketches. The uh, 16 apartments, I'd like to do a garden style, um, spread out in, in banks of four. Uh, the 35-foot uh, height rule, we won't even come close to that on any one of these properties. The new design is designed so that if you're standing at Sawyer Road, you're barely going to see anything. Um, it's not till you go in and turn left that you're really going to pick up on a lot of it. But just going in, there's a, uh, if you look at it, there is a wetland that kind of creates a circle. And I'd like to enhance that with uh, straw grasses, things like that, and actually create a common inside it. Um, there'll be plenty of uh, greeneries along uh, six or seven different places within the development. The entrance will have a, uh, small boulevard to it with a simple uh, simple signage. Um, what else have we got? As far as the cell tower goes, um, when I started to look at this property, a cell tower company came to me. Uh, we believed the property to be over 25 acres, which made it, the, the second piece of property, made it uh, applicable to a cell tower. Uh, I ended up buying it from the individual that owned it, and the cell tower deal between those two went away. Um, I adopted it, so to say. When we were out there surveying it, Steve Ross and myself, um, we came up with a little over 37 acres. Uh, when Crossroads was doing it, uh, they came up with about 25 acres. It turns out to be a little bit less. That is still ongoing. Um, it, at this point, it doesn't include Crossroads is another party that I have, I'm dealing with, because um, I do believe it will end up the 37 acres. At that point, then we come in for the cell tower. The reason I asked for the waiver on the cell tower is my understanding of that was who would want to have, buy into a development to find out that there was a cell tower after the fact. I'd rather have it all up front, right, everything. Um, the sewer line going uh, that we're going to provide gives access to all the residents in front of it. So there's 17 houses uh, that could pick up on it. Based on uh, our conversations with the sanitary district, there are a few that they don't know if the systems are failing or starting to, uh, based on some of their readings. And I'm not saying they are. Okay. Any of you are residents? I'm not saying that. Um, Taking the wetlands, the uh, house lots out of the wetlands, to me was a big one. When I went back and read your comments, it was like, how did you miss that one? Um, this is, I made it too easy for you to tell me that I needed a wetland pier uh, review. The, I think that pretty much gives you the flavor. Uh, what you will see next is more of a, uh, uh, a design that I think you want. There are no dead-end streets. The only dead-end would be where it goes into the land trust, um, and that would have a turnaround on it. So we'll field any questions you'd like. Thank you. Um, I'll just kind of say by way of transitioning to board discussion that clearly given the fact that there's a whole new plan that none of us have seen and we got a nice description of, but it's only kind of in our imaginations right now, I think we need to keep any board discussion at this stage pretty high level and really not, frankly, devote too much time to 
to uh, drilling down on details when we don't really have them in front of us. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, there are some some uh, bigger picture considerations that we can weigh in on. Uh, and we we'll start with you, Roger. Okay. So, if I understand you correctly, um, you you need you want to get this sewer line connected to Sawyer Road. The idea was to get it from 114 into Sawyer Road before any construction started right. uh, later in the fall. Okay. Um, so this whole project is going to be phased, I would assume, isn't it? There'll be three phases. Three? Correct. O over like three years or something like that? or As quick as we can do it. Okay. Is this going to run into this... Um, this um, issue we have with so many house, housing permits and all this other stuff, you know, the reserve and all this? Or is that um, opening up a can of worms? I'd have to look further into that. I think okay. it's significantly less than the threshold, but it could. It depends on the yeah. speed of the development and how quickly they build houses. Um, on, on the cell tower, I'm kind of curious about that. Um, uh, looking at this this one we have, where, where would that go? Um, well, you see the bank of... Uh, Is it where, the sen where it says senior rental units in that area there? Correct. Feasibly, there's uh, 18 more acres out there. There's okay. at least seven. Okay? So it would be back in there. Those 16 rentals have now been moved. They're no longer there. Oh, they're not? They won't be on the plan you're going to get. Oh, I see. Okay. As you see, the cut across that property, uh, that's where we'll be ending. That gives us the 29 and a half acres if you move up. Yeah. And beyond that, I would still have, uh, I believe it's seven acres, and what we believe is another 12. So you could still develop that land, though, in, in the future? Well, I'll tell you that the biggest aspect of this whole thing is watching the traffic on Sawyer Road. Hmm. I've listened to a few of the neighbors. I've tried to bring that down. Um, <coughs> if I had brought this forward with all the acreage, the number of units based on the, the zoning would have been a lot higher. Not trying to do that. Um, we brought the number down to what I think is very considerable for the, the size of the land. Um, we brought down the number of bedrooms that, once again, takes out um, daily trips. <coughs> Okay, so if you had um, your druthers, you'd, you'd build a transmission tower based on a 25 acreage requirement now and then come back to us later on and see if you could get it reduced to five acres? Or do you mm. want to just go with the five acres to start with? It would not be me building the transmission tower. No, I understand that, but I mean... Um, if they came for approval, uh, depending on what they and the board came up with as far as the time frame, um, I just wanted to put, I'd rather be transparent and put it out there that that's what we would be looking for, would be the waiver on that. Um, to me, it doesn't make too much sense to tie up a huge parcel of land uh, in the middle of the woods um, on something that you typically need about three acres to do. And, and you've had um, cell phone companies, carriers, express some interest in having a tower there? That's how the whole thing started with me and this piece of property. Okay. Um, what, what's your feelings regarding the sidewalk on um, Sawyer Road? I, I would hope the benefit that I was given the town was the, the uh, sewer line extension. Hmm. Um, the sidewalk on Sawyer Road, the hard part about that is you get into surveys on every property. We just had to do a topography and survey of uh, Sawyer Road to create um, the sewer line system. Uh, I think it gets a little cumbersome. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather put, and I think it would be a bigger benefit to the people in the development to have a sidewalk on one side on that, in there. Internally? Internally. About, yeah. But Especially with the uh, donation of the land and the uh, egress to the land trust land, um, I think it will be used. Um, the... Um, Across the street from your development, um, we don't have it on here. Is there, I, I'm not sure, is, is there any land there that's uh, part of the middle school? Do, you, do, you, do we have any idea about that? 
because I know I know there were t there's trails back there. Just na you know, nothing. You know, not sophisticated trails, but there's trails that the kids have used for years and years and years. And I'm just kind of curious whether there's any trails that might be leading close to where this development may be, because it's possible that, that maybe. I mean, I think the, the thing is, kids coming out of that neighborhood to walk to school. Mm -hmm. That would be the need for the sidewalks. And if there's a trail that can be enhanced that leads up to that campus, that might be worth looking into. Because I know there's trails throughout that whole system there. That there's can, trails all over there. Yeah. But I mean, that might be one option, you know, in lieu of having a, a sidewalk along Sawyer Road. Uh, just, just a thought. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, the um, right, so basically, this is this is. There's parts of it uh, that are correct. There's <laughs> parts that are not. Um, I'd love to walk over there and show you it. No, it's okay. And make it simple. <laughs> um, I guess the, I guess the biggest I'll... change is it takes all the house lots out of the wetlands. Yeah. Okay, I. I'm all set, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Roger. Nick? Thank you. Um, so I think you're kind of in a kind of an interesting spot here because the way I read the, is this in the TTD uh, overlay? Whoops, it appears at the back portion. I think Mr. O'Leary said is in the overlay district. But we'd have to, we'd ask the applicant to show us that. Right. For, for so there's a bunch of requirements wherever that tower ends up if that's what you pursue. It shows as a special, special exception for this zone. So you still need the 25 acre minimum lot size, correct? Correct. So to, to put a tower anywhere on this property, the way this ordinance is currently written, you really can't develop the first, it, the back half of this. The, so the back half of it though, with it being 24.1 acres, would disqual uh, disqualify the cell tower. I understand that, unless I added when it becomes one. Right now, I'm, this is held in two hands. Uh, okay. The front part is in my name, the back part is in my wife's and my name. So phase two is? Correct. It's phase two, 25 acres? Correct. It is. Phase two is 25 acres. No, it, it's under 25 acres until we resolve um, okay. a land issue. So you've got some paperwork to pass back and forth. I guess I'm not clear where that line is. It looks to me like if in this plan, you might be proposing housing that falls within what you would need to make up 25 acres. Um, once again, with it being in two hand, uh, two bodies, um, and that's how we'll bring it forward. Right. Okay. We'll deal with what, what's the I'm not trying to avoid your question yeah, in I, any way. Um, what I'm saying is try not to get too far ahead of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I think at some point you're going to have to decide which path to choose. And you come to us with the plans I think you should have a clear vision of what that path looks like and then um, outside of that I don't think it's a whole lot I can comment on at this point I completely understand the comment of, of know which path uh, and that's kind of what tonight was for um, I'd like to meet with the residents of the street but I needed a foundation to start with um, so that's why I'm here thank you thanks Nick uh, Robin yeah, so um, I think that you've made a very good um, argument uh, for the waiver for the sidewalk. First, that the sidewalk is only on one side of the street, so you're just basically not putting it on both sides of the street. You're asking for just it on one side of the street. And the public benefit that you are providing by running the public sewer all the way down Sewer Road and phasing it in with the, you know, the uh, Gorham Road traffic, I think, is... Um, uh, very proactive and I also commend uh, you for your proactive notification regarding the tower transmission tower being there and, and sort of your full disclosure to um, both the planning board as well as um, future homeowners kind of a thing. I, I do applaud you for that. Um, I also thank you for reconsidering um, the wetlands um, disruption and um, also in doing so, tying in sort of like the, the, the VR uh, zoning requirements of, of grids and interconnections and minimizing dead ends. So that's very much um, appreciated. 
Um, some of the, I guess, the, the, the high level sort of questions and concerns I have though are um, with respect to the transmission tower <coughs> on that phase two. Um, as Nick was pointing out, you know, there's, there's a lot of legal work that you're going to have to be working through too mm -hmm. and proactively. I wonder if there's any complications of Millbrook traversing that phase two, because that's my understanding that that's what that line is right there across dissecting that. Is that Millbrook? That's where, no. No? Uh, Millbrook. Is the wetland itself? It is. Okay. Um, and I will tell you, uh, Dale Brewer, who did the wetlands and the vernal pools for me, I uh, did not find that to be a stream. Um, so I, I don't believe that in, in our eyes that that was part of Millbrook. Mm -hmm. Somebody else may tell me different because I have mm -hmm. a feeling I'm going to get a peer review. I have a feeling you could be right. Um, um, but we do have a lot of, um, we do have a lot of riverine wetland systems mm -hmm. in our community. So I, I understand the sort of, um, sort of confusion or questioning if you're not in it every day kind of thing. So um, uh, I'm wondering if you have a new number for the anticipated, and I'm sort of looking at Steve here, is if you know what the new anticipated um, wetland impacts are. Did I hear less than 15,000 square feet? It's actually uh, right now with that plan, we're over the 4,300, but less than the 15. It hasn't okay. been calculated exactly. But we do know that with the other plan that you have not seen, we're less than 4,300 square feet with road impact crossings. Oh, great. That sounds fantastic. I can tell you that if with about 10,000 square feet of wetlands, um, I could change it. Uh, you could add lots very easily. Right, right. Um, yeah. And that would be about the total impact in the whole project. Yeah. And, and so I guess of that sort of that six acres that is going to Scarborough Land Trust, mm -hmm. is that primarily the, mm. the, the wetlands that are being gifted? No, or is it's, it? it's half and half. It, okay, yeah. habitat. So it's potentially upland, not just limited to wetland. Matter of fact, where the, yeah. park and, where the road would run into that, the egress, yep. that yep. runs into uh, uplands. Fabulous. Uh, by design. It okay. was originally going to come a, a different spot, okay. but that would have run into wetlands, so I changed it. Yeah, and one of my questions you answered as well proactively, it's like you were reading my mind. It's kind of scary. Um, where were you going to put the Habitat for Humanity? Um, and I like that you said mix it in with the, um, the existing development Absolutely. so that it's not just here's the Habitat for Humanity neighborhood. It's actually mixed in throughout, so that's great. Um, the only sort of other, I have two other questions. Um, one is for probably Steve and one is for staff. The first one for Steve would be um, infiltration basins. I just worry about the suitability of the soils and, and as our old statics professors say, with wetlands and, and things like that, you yeah. can't push on a rope, so you can't make it infiltrate if it's not gonna go. And, and uh, any, anything that I mentioned about infiltration is probably underdrained Okay. infiltration basins. Uh, is what I was referring to. Okay. We haven't looked at the stormwater design. We know it's going to be a challenging site. Uh, okay. The topography is, is slight. Yeah. Um, so what we do is uh, maybe fairly large and shallow and so we can get it to drain correctly. And I think you're on the right track as far as not trying to get one huge central right. stormwater right. pond. But by having these, like treating it at the source, mm -hmm. that's the definition of low impact and development. That, and that's what, uh, when I uh, first yeah. talked with uh, Mark, uh, with this layout is a lot of the corner lots okay. would probably be required to be Great. small infiltration or biofiltration yep. systems. Perfect. So we were looking at multiple ones and I think I told Mark four to eight or something yeah. crazy like that. Have you done any geotechnical analysis yeah. yet no. to, to look at the soil types? No, okay. we haven't. And so my last question um, is about traffic. And if the traffic is potentially going from a C to a D, does that trigger sort of, um, you know, a light or improvements for traffic movement, either Jamel or Angela? Can you answer that, Angela? Um, well, I can say, as far as traffic signal goes, I, I don't see it triggering that, but you'd have to look at the analysis. It's more about the main corridor when okay. you start having those side streets. I know we've looked at a lot of places where 
automatically think this really needs a light. Mm -hmm. But when it's about a mobility of Sawyer Road is, mm -hmm. or Route 1 as opposed to the side streets, that's where it becomes a little dicey. So it's not automatic to do to jump ahead to something like that. Um, they would look, you could look at some mitigation measures though. There's other things that the traffic engineer okay. um, can look at to say, yeah, you can't, you can't make it worse. So okay. that would be something they'd have to address. All right, Steve, did you in, want to respond? In uh, discussions with Bill Bray this morning, um, the specific one at, at Gorham Road, um, that's a state, a state road, it's 114. Um, uh, specifically in regards to a light, no. Uh, one, the state probably would not allow it. Uh, two, it would probably not be Bill's recommendation okay. to the town in regards to that either. And right now he did not feel that uh, because once I saw a level CD, I'm going, okay, which one yeah. is it? Yeah. And uh, the break off is 25 second delay or okay. queuing, um, and it's 26 <laughs> seconds. And as Mark had indicated, and I think I've indicated that a change from a three bedroom to a two bedroom or a two bedroom to a one bedroom changes counts. Okay. And once those counts are changed, you can trigger that one second and we can be right back where we were before. Okay. So I don't think it's going to be an issue. I just want to say keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate your transparency and your forward thinking, so thank you. Thank you much. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I, I too appreciate um, your transparency with this and I certainly appreciate your willingness to put in the um, uh, the sewers. Uh, we've had recent developments and it's always been a, a question, especially with wetlands, uh, at what point do we say we, we can no longer really look at a lot of septic systems? Uh, it's just too much and at what point do we need to start to really extend the sewer systems? So I appreciate your taking that now. Uh, and bringing that to the town and benefiting all of the folks along Sawyer Road as, as well. Um, I am also appreciate uh, your willingness to uh, merge the Habitat for Humanity houses into the whole community. Uh, I, I've never been thrilled with the, the concept of saying, okay, well, these, this sitting over here, well, that's affordable as though um, there's something wrong with that for the people who live there. And by moving all of those into the community and integrating it into the community, um, I think it actually enhances the community to have a sort of uh, mix of age, mix of income, uh, and I appreciate your willingness to do that. I, I was getting terribly confused by this, uh, the original one, so I, I'm glad uh, we're going to be looking at a different one shortly. Um, in, I, I, have, I guess I have a question. I love, uh, I appreciate your, your interest in providing storage, uh, but was that for folks in the houses or, or folks in uh, the rental units, the duplexes? Or? What I'd like to do is put in a uh, self-storage unit, 20 to 30 units, not big units, um, for residents only. I don't want to create more traffic, but there's a lot of people that come out of larger houses, and we're looking at 1,000 to 1,500 square foot houses, uh, apartments, things of that nature. Um, if you've ever tried to clean your house out, it's not that easy to get rid of everything. So, I, are you talking, I, so these houses then would be on slabs, no basements? Is that there's some slabs, there's some, uh, there'll be some of it done the same way uh, Hillcrest does it, where you have a, a low ceiling basement with utilities and storage. Okay. Um, when you have the small, just to kind of keep in mind, when you have small lots and this sort of density, uh, the open space and the, and the community gathering areas become very important. So as you are looking at this design, please, please keep that in mind, a way to create community is to allow small open spaces where folks uh, in contiguous houses can, um, can gather. So, uh, so that you understand, for instance, coming off of Sawyer Road, this would all become open space. Okay. okay? I'd enhance the wetlands, you'd have a common. Um, I'd put in a couple of a place here for a, a nail receptacle, another one over here. 
pull off and get away from it so that we're not obstructing the traffic. Uh, I'd like to come in with a 24 foot road coming in and then go to a 22 foot road here uh, to cut down the uh, pavement. Um, there's two or three other areas that are going to have open areas that I'd like to see, much like uh, Joe Costacci just said, let the uh, residents decide how they're going to be used. Um, this is going to call for about 2.2 acres of open space. The waiver that I had put in for thinking that the land I was given the land trust would cover that. Um, after reading your comments, I said no, that what they're asking for is something very different. Um, that's certainly a community uh, benefit. It doesn't have to be just a resident of this neighborhood benefit. So I wanted to create a couple that would work for them. Uh, in that common area that I just showed you, I'd like to create a uh, about an eight car parking area right off the road um, so that it would get used. Uh, so the, there will be plenty of open space. I think I cover the 2.2 acres without considering the uh, land trust land. All right, thank you. Um, just to clarify, I, I'm looking at the phase one and the phase two. In phase one, are the just that immediate group of houses closest to Sawyer Road, and then phase two, uh, in the old map, phase one is uh, lot one to 36, and phase two is lots 37 and up. Is that yeah, correct? Uh, now you've got to, I know, I understand you I'm have a new one. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the uh, work you're doing and your, uh, especially your contribution to the town here uh, with the sewer system. Cor Corey? Thank you. Oh, yes, Rob. Could I just ask one more question? Sure, one more. Okay. Um, do you envision this being similar to the, um, the Hillcrest community, the newer phase down there? No. Um, I could give you a couple of communities outside the state of Maine that these would be more like. Um, actually, there's one down in Arundel. Okay. Uh, I, I have an add-on to my one question. Did, did, did you mention you had a South Portland development too? I had a four-lot subdivision there, yes. Oh, four lots, okay. Yeah. All right. um, I was hoping your one question was to turn this over, but I guess not. <laughs> the, uh, I, with the permission of the board, I'll send you, or Steve will send you, the revised plan. It, it'll be part of the the next package. The, you know, the next time that you're on the agenda, we'll, there'll be that'll that will have been reviewed and vetted, and there'll be, I'm sure, a new round of staff um, comments. Hopefully, shorter, but um, that'll all be that'll go through the regular process of vetting and uh, assembly by the by the staff. So we'll have we will have reviewed that next time you come in front of us. Okay. So, um, all set? I'm all set. Okay, good. Um, before I uh, say my little piece, I think Jamel had a quick note on zoning on one of these items. Yeah, so I just sort of cruised through the zoning ordinance. It doesn't appear that storage units are allowed in the zone. I you would be correct. I would just want you to be aware of that before you... And that's why we were going to ask for a special exception on that. Um, I thought it was key to keep it within the development. Uh, if it's not something that can happen, it's not something that can happen. I understand that. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'll echo my my colleagues by saying, first of all, we definitely do appreciate the transparency and the responsiveness. We appreciate the fact that you were already had already turned around a, a new uh, set of plans based on staff's feedback, and hope you understand why we can't you know, sort of review it here in real time, but we do appreciate the overview. Um, and certainly, uh, I also appreciate the, the contributions through the contemplated contributions to Habitat, and the fact that, that those will be integrated within the community, and also the extension of the sewer line. Um, just on the topic of sort of community benefits, I'm always gonna advocate for more sidewalks. Um, I appreciate where you're coming from and that there are some other benefits here. Um, I'm 
you know, I guess I'm fine with sidewalks on just one side of the street within the neighborhood. Um, I'll still advocate for having sidewalks on Sawyer Road as well, um, just because, you know, we, we only get so many bites at the apple and, you know, there's a lot of pedestrian activity in, in this, this is a small apple in this part of town. So, um, so take that under advisement, you know, just in the spirit of sketch plan review. Um, there are references to the traffic study, which again, we, we also have not seen. We'll look forward to seeing that. Um, wetlands delineation, again, you, as you described it, you're taking virtually all, if not all, the, the house lots off uh, out of the wetlands, which is great. We'll look forward to seeing that. Um, you know, I think you seem to already be acknowledging uh, the appropriateness of having a peer review of that, which I will, um, which I will advocate for. Um, and, and just as a general comment, and this came up with the previous item, again, this, you know, the, the, a peer review is really not, it's not meant to impugn anyone's integrity or technical abilities, and we do peer reviews. We, saying the town generally does peer reviews of traffic studies and uh, other things as well, and it's just really, it's another tool for us to make sure that we've, we've got a comprehensive and accurate um, sense of things. So appreciate your understanding on that. Um, the transmission tower, to me at this stage, you know, that is a whole other can of worms, mm -hmm. to use a technical term, and I appreciate you wanting to be upfront about it with us and with uh, current and prospective neighbors, um, but there clearly, there seem to be some really, really basic threshold questions there in terms of the acreage and um, the process, and I'm sure you've, you know, followed uh, that process as it's unfolded in a couple other parts of town, and, you know, it's not something to enter into lightly. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, so just, again, make sure you do your do your homework on that. Um, and all the usual things, you know, toward the end of the, uh, you know, the last couple pages of the staff comments, which are pretty typical of, of sketch plan review stage. Um, uh, you know, we talked about stormwater, auto turn simulations, and, you know, a lot of the, as I know your engineer is familiar with, just make sure you follow through on, on all those items as well. Um, but again, appreciate what we've seen and heard today, and we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration. Thank you, Mike. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we've been here for over two hours. I'm going to propose we take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back, refresh, and plow through as much as we can. Thank you.
All right. Item number eight again was tabled. Uh, item number nine. Southgate Self Storage LLC requests an amended site plan for 11 Southgate Road, Assessor's Map R63, Lot 1. Jamel? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, this is in the Industrial Zoning District at 11 Southgate Road at the Southgate Self Storage Facility. Uh, the applicant's proposing a site plan amendment to remove the existing tower on the site and replace it with a 1,394 square foot self storage building. The board may recall that the original site plan approval from 2007 included the redevelopment of the, of the existing tower into a mix of uses including storage and residential. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant provide building elevations and floor plans uh, to ensure that the design will be coordinated with the existing buildings on the site. And staff also recommends that the applicant provide the board with a host of updated materials uh, for review including a landscape plan, erosion control plan, lighting plan, stormwater management materials, and an auto turn simulation for a 40 foot long ladder truck. Uh, these materials have not been provided to date and will need to be reviewed by staff and the board. That's what I have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so before I hand it over to the applicant, um, and, you know, based on Jamel's overview and my sense of, of things here, uh, there clearly are some, some loose ends. Um, don't seem to be any obvious showstoppers, but you know, we'll want to see sort of where the board ends up and um, whether we perhaps consider this as a consent item for next time or, or whatever the approach would be. But um, let's see where we are and we'll, we'll go from there. And with that, I'll hand it to you. Oh, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Again, my name is Sean Frank. I'm an uh, engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Ed Benjamin. Uh, of uh, uh, Southgate Self Storage LLC. I guess we saw this as a much more straightforward process, if you will, um, due to the fact that basically, you know, 90% uh, of the construction has occurred on the property. Uh, you know, the, the site had been approved. Uh, we worked through some iterations through the planning board over a number of years. Uh, these three buildings uh, were approved for self storage, are in fact located on the site. Uh, with all of the impervious areas as shown, as well as the, uh, the areas for the fire truck, uh, the whole issue would come down to the existing tower building that was there. Uh, it had been the applicant's initial intent uh, was to maintain the structure of that four-story building, if you will, to utilize two stories of that structure for uh, self-storage. St storage uh, In the top two stories, um, for his own residential use, it was going to be his, uh, his building, his, uh, his residence. Um, and that's what we had gone through and got the approval for uh, that has not been constructed. Uh, so rather than to maintain this four-story structure, if you will, uh, the applicant's intent basically now is to put one more mini-storage building in, self-storage building, but it look just like the other buildings. Um, you know, from an elevation standpoint, it's the same metal building that we have out there. Uh, a floor plan uh, for a self-storage, of course, you know, the interiors, the internals, it's, it's empty space. There's a uh, uh, there's internal uh, walls that, based upon the need of the, uh, the residents, if they want 20 feet or 40 feet or, or 10 feet, um, and, and some lights, and that's all we have internally. Uh, we lost a driveway uh, that came across, so from an impervious standpoint, it's pretty much the exact same impervious area we were talking about. Uh, we don't have to extend any utilities to the site now because the, the electric is there before we were going to bring sewer and water. Uh, so I guess from our standpoint, we saw it as a much simplified site, if you will, uh, basically lose a four-story structure with pretty much uh, a, a somewhat larger footprint to a single-story self-storage facility that's, you know, the exact same materials that we have out there now. The site doesn't change in terms of access around the buildings to get in and out to the facility. Uh, we have two small driveways on either side. Actually, uh, this area will just be more of a sidewalk, if you will, because these will actually be for walk-ins. Again, what we see now is some small areas. They just want, you know, a, a five-foot space, if you will. Um, the landscaping's all been done. That was required to allow us for the first, uh, 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 for the first, you couldn't have the first occupancy without the landscaping being done or the pavement. Uh, the stormwater management in this particular case was uh, basically maintaining that 75 foot buffer off from the wetlands, uh, which has been maintained and conveying a piece of property to, uh, to the state associated with that. So uh, uh, again, from an overall site standpoint, uh, we saw it as a simpler site, if you will. Uh, uh, again, with a building that, you know, is, is identical to the three buildings that are out there in terms of materials and those types of things. Um, and certainly in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the auto turn, 
Uh, the site is there. Uh, we're not going to be basically doing any improvements to it. We do understand certainly, you know, if, if we need to do something from the lightings, we'll certainly give you the, uh, uh, the typical cut sheets that we're going to have for the lighting fixtures. But, uh, uh, you know, aside from that, again, landscaping is done, stormwater is done. Uh, you know, the site's basically in place. Uh, we're just basically utilizing that, that footprint, if you will, for a single-story self-storage unit rather than a four-story combinations, storage, and uh, an apartment complex. So, um, again, we'll certainly work with staff to provide them any information they're looking for. Uh, but in this particular case, due to the fact, like I say, 90% of the construction has, in fact, occurred and is in place, uh, including the landscaping and whatnot, uh, we saw it certainly as a much more straightforward process. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, between Mr. Benjamin and myself, we do our best to answer any questions the board has, and I'd conclude my presentation. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Um, don't know if there is anyone, but we do have the opportunity for public comment on this. If anyone would like to come up at this point? All right, seeing none, I'll put it up for grabs with the board. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this? Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at, at the plan. Where, where would people enter that self-storage building, the new one? On both sides. So the, the dark. I'm sorry, can you see this? <coughs> we also have it on the screens. So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, all along the side and the doors would be on this side right here where the pavement actually meets the building. Okay, I, I'm not familiar with the site, so if you could just uh, help me a little bit here. Is, is, how is the site accessed? Uh, one main driveway. Is, uh, there a, is there an electronic gate or anything else or is it just? Excuse me. I'm Edward Benjamin. I'm the owner of it. We put up a gate for security, and we've never closed it. Um, <laughs> it's open 24 hours a day. The, uh, there is a fire lock on it for the fire department to get to the mechanical room. There's a key, key box there, knock box for them. But we don't even occupy it. We have a little... One of the units is electrical room and stuff. We use that for an office when we have to be there. So where would, uh, if, if you have somebody in an office, what's the parking set aside for them? This whole paved area is all parking. When you drive in, you, you're actually driving up to the units. Each one has a, its overhead door. So all the dock area for the whole project is all driveway. Right, all, all between the buildings here, Rachel. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically the doors on this one are on both sides. This one's on one side. That one's on one side. So basically you... Yeah, you I, I guess I was just thinking floor. if somebody's going to be occupying the office, where are they parking? Just where we just whatever this... The, the office is a 5 by 10. Thank you. And you are you are eliminating one of the driveways, so that is, um, yes. is that's going to be. Yes. Is that currently paved? No. So it's gravel. Yes. It's supposed to be paved. It, it was proposed to be paved, but we discontinued it totally. That was going to be my house with a drive-through driveway in it, in and out, out to the street. So there was going to be from the roadway in, into the structure, and out the other end, back to the street. Is there any change proposed in the project sign that you've got up there? We've done. The, no. The sign. Oh, the sign's been up there. It was all city approved and so forth. No, no change to the sign. No, no, no change to the sign. Yeah, that was, that was the question. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I just have a quick question. Oh. Um, this little horseshoe thing um, in front of it now, it's like a dri sorry, driveway. It used to be a, a gravel driveway. This used to be a cell tower site that right. they, re they okay. built cell sections, and they would drive trailer trucks in on that thing sure. and raise these dishes up on top of the structure. That's all been discontinued. That driveway that you see there is grass today. Yeah, that's pretty much filled in again. I, mean, I should just take that off the plan, actually. It's, oh, okay, it's but what I'm getting at, Sean, though, too, is um, I know you, you probably already have your DEP permit for this and everything. I don't know. I don't think we needed a DEP permit for this at the time. 
Why? Did you not? What did you not trigger? Did you not trigger one acre of impervious? Did not trigger one acre. I believe about it. Okay. I guess the point I was getting at is that just because it's grass now doesn't mean that it's not contributing as far as you know being impervious area is concerned. It's it's not a pavement at all. It was gravel at one time. But so packed gravel is still in, considered impervious area. Okay. So I guess I, I just want to continue to have you work with staff to to make sure that uh, the list of things that are here are here to the staffs um, meets the staffs sort of expectations. Um, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Anyone else? Roger. Yeah. Just explain to me why the driveway on the north side is different than the south side. That little seven, apparently that seven yeah, foot that section. Seven foot section yeah. You're right there, yes. The back side of this has a two um, on the end of the building. It's a wetlands set back there, that pin where the wetlands is. So we move the area back away from. So you're going to have to walk to those <coughs> doors on that building. Right. You just had it so you were basically going to walk to the, there were going to be small units on that north side, so you can basically you can park in that bigger area and just walk over to the doors. Okay, so it's just, a, it's just an expanded sidewalk. Exactly yes. right. Okay. Exactly what it is. Um, is this the old Gabriel electronics tower? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. All right. Um, I, I don't have anything else. Thanks, Roger. Um, yeah, I don't have any issues with, with this on the merits either. Uh, seems fairly straightforward, and as you said, Sean, generally actually kind of simplifies the site. Um, I guess you know the only question for me is more of a procedural one, and was alluded to earlier. Um, you know, we sort of look at that list of what is it, six bullet points under the second uh, arrow there on the on the staff comments, just sort of. Uh, items that still need to be provided to staff. Um, seems like a situation where we're kind of bordering on, you know, maybe being a little too much for conditions of approval. Uh, sort of puts a lot of burden on staff. Um, I don't, you know, I hate to put you on the spot, Jamel. Um, what is your, what is your gut feeling in terms of, of handling these as conditions of approval, knowing that, you know, there may be some things that need to be verified? Um, you know, we could, again, the other option, and the, I welcome any other board input as well, um, set this up, sort of tee it up as a consent item, provided that everything is submitted in the interim. I think that, that the second option is probably the, the best for staff, um, but that's, you know, ultimately up to the board if they feel comfortable with staff reviewing the missing materials. Uh, mm -hmm. We could certainly do that, but, you know, for consistency, I think a consent item would be probably your best bet. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that's probably where I lean. Um, and again, I welcome any, any dissenting feelings on that. And I'm always sensitive to, you know, time is always of the essence for, mm -hmm. for owners, mm -hmm. developers. But um, this, to me, seems like a fairly <coughs> reasonable approach. All right. So I, I think... Um, I would just leave it at that, and it seems pretty straightforward. Maybe another, you know, bit of cleanup on the plan here and there to reflect okay. the okay. sort of the ground reality, and should be nice, quick, and easy next time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Item number 10, m &R Holdings LLC requests a site plan review for lot one of Crossroads Plan Development District, phase one, assessor's map R52, lot four. Jamal? Just teeing this up, give me a second, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Crossroads Plan Development team is back for uh, a few agenda items tonight. First one is uh, the development or preliminary site plan review for uh, lot number one in the overall phase one subdivision. Um, just so 
By way of background, in April, the board granted master plan approval for phase one of the development. At the last meeting in June of 18, nice picture. Um, you get it? You get going? <laughs> to, uh, where was I? Okay, at the last meeting, uh, June 2018, the planning board uh, approved the preliminary subdivision plan for the phase one uh, project in the downs. So tonight, uh, the applicants in front of the board uh, for a preliminary site plan review for the de development of lot one, uh, proposing four 12 unit apartment buildings uh, with associated parking and landscaping. Once again, the applicants seeking high level review uh, given that, that the overall subdivision plan has not been approved by the board and the applicant has not finalized several of the required review elements, uh, such as main DEP permit, final traffic study, lighting plan, uh, the board should focus on landscaping, architecture, parking, and any other site elements that may influence the development of the applicant's uh, final sub site plan submission. So basically an elevated site plan review, uh, no final action tonight, and just a good way to learn more about what they're proposing on lot one and two and three. Thanks. And um, as I know, our our next presenter well appreciates. Um, we can't take up any new items after 10:30, so just be mindful of the time and mm -hmm. try to get through this as thoroughly and efficiently as we can. Great. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Dan Bacon with Goral Palmer. I'm here on behalf of MNR Holdings. Um, and Rocky Vespera and Peter um, Lavoy. Lavoy is here on our behalf. And uh, thanks for the introduction uh, from Mr. Torres on this review. Um, we want to review both lot one and then lots two and three. Um, really piggybacking on uh, the presentation we did a few weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, on the preliminary subdivision for the first phase of development in the Downs. Um, and as you likely remember, with the preliminary subdivision, lots one, two, and three were, um, there was not any uh, plan shown or any details. So that's why we're here this evening to kind of fill in that information and have a discussion with the board on the site plans for multifamily housing and then um, some condos and duplex and then the, the memory care, which is the next item. So, I also had a couple of slides just to help with the presentation, um, particularly the review of architecture. And again, this is the overall uh, phase one layout. But given how integrated it is, we kind of feel like we should be presenting off of this plan and then kind of diving into more detail with, with the individual lots. Um, so lot one is the area um, where, I'll work off of this plan here, lot one is this portion of the project, um, and this is the, the, the formal site plan for Lot 1. It provides for four uh, multifamily buildings, each with 12 units in them. It's a mix of one and two bedroom units, um, and it's been designed to, to kind of stand alone as uh, rental apartments, but also be very kind of integrated with the trails and with the sidewalk system and the overall uh, plan development for this first phase. In terms of infrastructure, a uh, lot ones served by public water, public sewer, fiber optics, underground electric, um, natural gas, and that's coming in off of the Scarborough Downs Road, which was reviewed as part of the subdivision plan at your last meeting. In terms of parking, the majority of the parking is in the parking fields uh, within the site. There is some additional on-street parking, both along the Downs Road and the <coughs> residential street, providing access to the neighborhood behind uh, the apartments. And again, that's why we're showing kind of more than just the site plan to give you the context of the on-street parking and the sidewalk system that ties in. Um, there's 76 um, what we're calling off-street parking spaces, so the, the, the parking in the parking lots. There's additional 19 um, on-street parking spaces. We see the on-street parking spaces primarily for guests, both, both for the apartments and for, it was talked about at the last meeting, guests for the residential neighborhood. 
And so those parking spaces that are closer to the residential neighborhood, we think are gonna be really kind of shared guest parking for the apartments, but also the neighborhood to handle kind of um, more than your typical household parking needs. In terms of site amenities, there's, there's a lot of sidewalk facilities. Um, we're trying to make this very walkable. Um, bike racks are planned, um, given the bike lane and really the, the vision for this project being kind of bikeable and part of a larger uh, community, as we've talked about a lot in the past. We we'll also have a meeting lined up with the transit providers and intend to have strong transit service both in this, hopefully this first phase, but um, particularly as future phases come online, we're gonna get a sense for what kind of um, service can be provided by the, the transit agencies in the region. Um, Another component of the design is there's actually a small building that's being planned um, at the end of the common. So the green space on the plan is towards the, the neighborhood, so towards the east. And we've kind of purposely designed uh, the mailboxes and a, a small building for packages, kind of an Amazon type building that's in that common area. And we see that as an opportunity for a good location in terms of uh, people congregating there, using the common, um, and also kind of daily going to, to kind of get their mail or their, their latest package from Amazon. Um, so that's, that's fairly intentional in terms of its location. Stormwater um, is, we've thought a lot about the stormwater approach um, and are, uh, have designed the system to be kind of the low impact design, so LID. Um, and very distributed in terms of the stormwater facilities. And we're using a mix of focal point uh, stormwater technology. It's uh, very small footprint stormwater facilities that are gonna be planted. So they're gonna be coordinated with the landscape plan and our landscape architects kind of working on the planting details of that. And also uh, bioretention cells that are similar. So there are stormwater features that provide treatment but also have an aesthetic landscaping component um, and are going to be pretty attractive amenities beyond uh, providing the stormwater treatment necessary for the site plan. Similarly, um, our, we have a landscape plan that provides for kind of the streetscape that matches in with the Downs Road. So there's going to be maple and oak uh, street trees that are along the street system, but also are duplicated in the parking area. So it's all coordinated and, and attractive together. And then there's gonna be shrubs and more ornamental plantings around each of the buildings. Um, and we can get into more details if the board had questions on those. Uh, and along those lines, we've tried to, in, in places where there's a uh, transformer or other kind of ground mounted facilities have been trying to heavily plant those so that they're screened from, from the street. In terms of building architecture, this is one of the reasons we wanted to come to the board and at this preliminary stage before we've submitted um, for final approval around the time of prelim uh, sub final subdivision approval, we want to discuss architecture. Um, We've been approaching the architecture both in lot one and then you'll see in lots two and three and trying to be coordinated and then create kind of architectural themes for this project, particularly the main road coming in. Um, so the 12 unit buildings are three stories, as you see. Um, we're proposing them to be white and then in the other lots, uh, we have similar um, color scheme, but with some variations. This would be a clapboard building predominantly, but the, um, the projection, the center element where the doorway and the, uh, the peak is on both the front and the back, this per perspective is showing a rendering facing the Downs Road uh, for reference. Um, it's designed to be board and batten uh, architecture. Um, and on this building, and then you'll see on the other two, build the other two building types, we're proposing kind of white with black. So black window trim, window grills, um, and then darker charcoal gray uh, shingles. And then this 
this shows the building integrated with the landscape plan to give you kind of a full picture of the building in its in its setting on the site plan. We're also, as you see on the site plan, showing the buildings, the two facing the Downs Road, fairly close to the street, so engaged with the street and the sidewalk, um, and with the on-street parking and the bike lane that you can see on the image here. Um, really to kind of create more of that village kind of urban context coming into the project. It's, it's a denser project, it's a more compact, walkable project, and we want to have the buildings uh, reflect that. I think in addition to that, uh, a few other components. You talked about actually Millbrook in your last, uh, one of your last agenda items um, off Sawyer Road, I think is the the board likely recalls through our master planning process and subdivision, uh, preliminary subdivision process. There's the main stem of Millbrook traverses the site um, or borders the site to the east. And so on this site plan, this, this lot actually doesn't touch the main stem of Millbrook, but the next one, the next two do, where we're showing a 100 foot buffer to Millbrook. So that's greater than the 75 foot buffer or setback required under the Shoreland Zoning Extreme Protection District. Um, in addition to that, there is a small intermittent kind of tributary stream that's um, it's intermittent in that this time of year it's actually not holding a lot of water. So it's a it's a really a feeder stream into Millbrook. Um, and for that, and that stream really separates this pod of development or this portion of development with lots two and three, as you'll see in the next uh, agenda item. We're proposing and we've worked hard to establish a 75 foot buffer to that intermittent stream. So we're proposing 100 foot on the, the main stem, uh, which is a much more prominent stream, and, a, and a, a, 75, a minimum of a 75 foot buffer to the intermittent stream. It's actually greater than 75 in close to half of the length of the stream. Um, but in a few places, it's 75 feet, and that would be no disturb. Um, we've provided kind of setbacks and retaining walls to kind of to to achieve that that level of a buffer. I think a few other items um, before I can turn it back to to the board for discussion. Traffic, we've studied at the subdivision level. So, in and we're actually working over the course of the next month or so to conduct more detailed traffic counts at all the intersections surrounding the larger project. Um, so we've held off in submitting the board new traffic information for this presentation because we want to have <coughs> a more complete picture based on those traffic counts to be taken later in July and August and to be able to address all of the peer reviews comments that we've been provided previous through the preliminary subdivision. So we're not ignoring traffic, we're just have more work to do and have it incorporated into this submission. We wanted to focus on other items um, prior to coming back with traffic information. I guess two other topics to touch on before, um, before wrapping up is affordable housing. I guess the board knows there's a 10% affordable housing requirement um, within this district. And in this particular site plan, we're proposing to provide six of the 48 units as affordable rental housing. So this is going to be rental multifamily housing. So we'll meet the required, we'll meet the affordable housing expectations um, in, in six of these units, which is actually more than 10% of the total units on this lot. So there'll be some credit given to other parts of this phase. Um, and we're prepared to do that. And uh, lastly, we have been coordinating with the fire department, but haven't sat down with them to review the details of this latest plan. We actually have a meeting with them tomorrow um, to talk through this <laughs> lot one design and also the lots two and three that we'll be presenting in a few minutes. So um, we've laid out the hydrants and we've um, identified fire lanes, but we're going to meet with them to tomorrow to, to walk through those details and to get any final feedback that they may have before coming back to the board. So I think that's what I have at this point. Um, anything, Rocky? Okay. All right. 
Thank you. Appreciate the efficient overview. Um, do we have any public comment before we move to a board discussion? All right, seeing none. Uh, Nick, do you want to kick us off? Like it. It's plain simple. <laughs> it looks good. Um, it's very thorough for overview. I don't have a whole lot to add. It looks, it looks nice. Um, you know, it's you know, it's 24, 48, 48 units and 76 parking spots. There's a 76 out in the back that are off street and then right. 19 on, right? Right. That's that meets all your requirements on parking. Um, so there's not a whole lot to add here. I was even looking through your landscaping and it looks pretty nice. So architecture right. looks good. I'm okay. All right. Thanks, Roger. Um, sure. A uh, couple of questions um, on the um, philosophically on the affordable housing. You're going to have six units out of these 48. Um, are they just going to be mixed in different? They're not going to be all clustered together. I, I'm kind of curious as, as how you approach that. Good evening, uh, Rocky Brisbera. Uh, happy to answer that question. Um, we've we've successfully done that with our Carrier Woods project. Um, this the units that you're looking at here for Skyward Downs are very similar in size and, and fit and finish on the inside, and so. The way it works, uh, the way we figured out how to do it is those are floating. Those, there's no particular unit that's designated as affordable, if you will. It's a floating situation, so the units are all identical. You won't know one from, from another, uh, and that allows us the flexibility to keep tenants, you know, as they come and go so that we can meet that requirement. Um, we have kind of targeted six at this point in time on this section uh, of the project. I can tell you that that's probably still a little bit in flex, in flux, um, because we're not really sure how we're going to meet the rest of the requirements uh, in the for sale <laughs> units. We're working diligently with the affordable housing uh, group, and uh, we're at a meeting the other night, talked through a bunch of bunch of ideas, and, and we're getting there. Uh, and so right now we think it will be six in here. We may have to add a few more to, to actually meet it project-wide. But, um, you know, we've got the rental piece figured out. We know how to, how to do that at least. So, so do, you, do you use um, less costly fixtures and things like that? In, in nope. We just take a hit on the monthly rent. That's all, all there is to it. The units are complete. They're identical. You cannot tell one from another. Okay. It's just what we charge per month for a okay. certain unit. So um, architecturally, these are just very similar to Carrier Woods. Are they also similar to uh, Spring Street um, in Westbrook? Similar, yes. Building footprint size is about yes. the same on the Westbrook project, um, the Carrier Woods project here in Scarborough, the project that we did on Brick Hill in South Portland. The footprint's the same. The, you know, the finish of the outside has changed and has evolved over time as, we, as we've done these projects. So we're really trying to make this building. We know we have a model that works. Got a unit that rents very easily. Uh, it's a it's a building that we can afford to build and, and rent at the price we want to be at. So we've added some features, you know, exterior features, to try to make the building even more attractive uh, because of its location and, and where I, it is. I noticed the uh, at Carrier Woods. I think you have some color accents on some of the buildings, don't you? You have some like a green and we do have some yeah. colors there. Um, yeah. We've got do more colors over in Westbrook and, and in South Portland. But these are going to be primarily all white? We want to go white. I personally am not a fan of the colors. Okay. I think they look horrible, my personal <laughs> opinion. But the planning boards wanted those in those particular towns. Um, I like the white. I think it's clean. Uh, it's got a nice look. And it's certainly easy for us to maintain. As the years go by, we can, we can make sure the buildings stay in, in top condition. This will be a Risbera building, right? This will be a Risbera building. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm all set. I think it looks good, but, you know. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Robin? Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about um, when you say you take the hit on the rent kind of a thing for the affordable housing? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is sort of just background information for me, is how do folks then apply for that? Do you work with the town through a list of folks to that would qualify for that, sort of like Section 8, or how do you... 
No, how do you the, screen the, those? What people? we've done in the past is just advertise that we have, uh, you know, we have an affordable unit. Uh, mm -hmm. We have um, requirements from the town that we have to meet affordability mm -hmm. uh, stipulations, and we advertise. And so far, we've gotten we've gotten people that, that met the criteria, and then we have to report. Okay. Uh, we're so there is an established criteria, so it's yeah, not we have just established like criteria. So, and we report yeah. as we fill the units, we report, and then we have okay. to do a yearly uh, report Great. after that. Excellent, thanks. And can I ask what the monthly rents are generally for those affordable housing? At Carrier Woods, it's eleven hundred dollars. Eleven hundred dollars is considered affordable housing. Yes. Great, and that's the reduced rent. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess um, can you can can you all point me to. Is there a better rendering of the existing conditions other than sort of like the grade out on drawing C108 or something like that, Dan? Existing conditions. I'm, I'm looking at like 107 and 108, C107, C108. Is that the best that we have for existing conditions? Do you want me to plug mine in, Dan, for those sheets? Or? Sure, if you have those, yeah. Sure. Which sheets were those? I, I was thinking 106. Yeah, and the best that I see is C107 and C108. Yeah, just do the survey plan. Yeah, there's a no, we can provide that, and the survey plan is, doesn't yeah. provide you much information. Yeah, I think moving forward, I think it's important that we see the existing conditions plans because in moving through the workshops and things like that, it was important for, for us to see sort of like what the impacts are, um, especially since there were certain sort of commitments made to low impact design, development, um, green infrastructure and the like. And part of that is is really honoring what the natural hydrology is kind of a thing. Because I am seeing some, you know, fairly steep grades on the, I guess it would be the south side of, of what's happening here. And also understanding what the, what like the web, wetland impacts are for each site plan review process as we move forward. Because when we originally were, were in the workshop phase, not all of the natural resources have been completely inventoried. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we were promised that we would basically be working through that and understand what the what the natural resource impacts are versus, you know, the public benefit and the like kind of right. a thing. Yeah. So I guess, can you comment on how we can improve that and moving forward? Oh, I can comment on lot one in particular is, okay. um, that's been designed entirely on uplands. So there isn't <coughs> any wetland impacts associated with lot one. There are, even though they're right on C107, it looks like there are some mapped wetlands, very. There's not, there's not wetlands being filled to accommodate lot one. There's some grading towards the mm -hmm. wetland. And, and so we're not honoring the same setback that the shoreland zone has. We're not honoring a, a buffer for wetlands or are we? What's our wetland buffer setback? Within the subdivision on the single family house lots, um, there was a 25 foot buffer provided that was um, provided in a lot of places on the site plans, but not in all locations mm -hmm. um, yeah. for grading. And there's some storm water that was necessary for the Downs Road. Yeah, I just, um, I just feel like it's getting that. infringed upon a bit here. And, you know, I just want to, you know, this is the first site plan sort of review process. And, you know, maybe you could just, maybe you could, I guess, sort of the, the question that I'm having is, how are you implementing low impact design principles? Well, in terms of stormwater, we're doing specifically that. So we're using mm -hmm. distributed, I think there's probably four to five different stormwater treatment areas on right. this very small lot versus a larger stormwater pond or Outside of stormwater, are, are and I don't mean to interrupt, but outside yeah. of stormwater, are they are you using other low impact development techniques? Well, the entire phase one subdivision, um, over forty percent of it is open space, okay. and it's providing for 
um, 100 foot buffer to Mill Brook and 75 foot buffer okay. to Intermittent Stream. So we're considering that low impact in terms okay. of for a zone like this, which allows 20 units per acre um, in pretty dense development. Um, and, our and sort of where I'm going with impact. it, Dan, is that eventually we're going to start imposing on the wetlands and or in, infringing on the wetlands and impacting the wetlands and the integrity of the wetlands, which are providing us really good flood control. So what I'm wanting to know is how are you minimizing your pavement um, and the, in your impervious areas to basically maintain your current runoff rate and your duration from the site kind of a thing. And, sure. and maybe, um, I guess, other sort of ways that you're honoring the natural hydrology of the land. I mean, that was my understanding when we went through the workshop that, that these types of elements, low impact development, would be, would be you know, more showcased. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot there to kind of digest in terms of different approaches to low impact development. So I think part of it too, in terms of minimizing impervious areas, we've been intentional about designing for on-street parking versus additional parking lots that are generally more of a footprint. So, and that's been a balance working with the town on how much on-street parking they're willing to kind of maintain, mm -hmm. which is essentially public, publicly maintained parking. Um, so that's a measure that we've taken in terms of capitalizing on impervious that's already going to be there. Um, and we've worked, I think, quite hard in terms of stormwater, like I mentioned. Um, we're using uh, drip strips around the buildings to, to, to treat some stormwater versus, again, larger stormwater facilities. Um, and this is a pretty big balancing act in terms of what other expectations there are in the zoning. There's an expectation for interconnected streets um, and a grid street layout and fairly dense development. So we are impacting wetlands in places to cross, yeah. to, to meet the goals of the town in terms of street grid. So it's LID is a component, also um, mm -hmm. placemaking and creating a nice neighborhood is also a yeah. component. So. And with all due respect, I think we did, we, you know, you all were able to basically write the zoning for this area, too. Um, and, and so I guess I'm, I'm just a little bit, you know, that, that the existing conditions weren't even here. I mean, because that's like, that's, that's like st step one when, when dealing with low impact development. And, and, um, and I get that it's a balancing act for all things um, mm. considered, but I, I guess I'm, I'm just a little, um, I'm, I'm wondering about flood control. It really, that's really what it's coming down to is because currently, you, you know, this is sandwiched right between two threat, threatened and an impaired water body, and they all are gonna go to Scarborough Marsh. <clears throat> and we're going to be adding so much impervious cover that, as you know, is going to increase the runoff rate and it's going to decrease the, 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 the residence time on site. Mm -hmm. And so, we need to start thinking about these things now and not wait till later till there's flooding that's happening um, because the wetlands are being um, either overtaxed or infringed upon kind of a thing. So I guess I'll just stop there. Okay. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I want to uh, kind of continue along the, the line of uh, some of the questions that Roger Bealey was, uh, was addressing. Um, First of all, let me say that I do like the colors on houses. Uh, it softens them, um, and it provides a variety, and I think the work that's going on in Carrier Woods uh, reflects that, and I like the, I'd like the way that looks. Um, I understand that all one color uh, and a color white may be cleaner, um, but as I look at it now, if I look at the whole project, you, the first thing that you see as you come up the Downs Road uh, is six white blocks in a row. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about, or at least I've talked about from the beginning, is the importance of that initial approach and the importance of the initial architecture. As people come onto 
onto the crossroads. Um, they come to a beautiful boulevard, uh, and I think there would be then an, an anticipation that what they're going to see from there then on is going to be something that's, that's different, something that is um, distinctive. And what I see, I, I see uh, six white blocks in a row. Um, and I was certainly hoping for something better. I know when we had the workshop, uh, Ms. Auglis spoke about the, the architecture then, uh, and I did not chime in at the time, but I wish I had because I would have reinforced that. Uh, I think the houses, the buildings that I see are are an improvement over some of the plainer uh, architecture that we can see on, on Spring Street in Westbrook, but I don't think they're there yet. I think the buildings are okay. I think they're ordinary. Um, I think they are not what we were hoping, or at least I was hoping to see as a welcome to the, uh, to the Downs. So I'm certainly hoping that uh, we see some more tweaking uh, as we go along because right now, to me, it's ordinary. It's pedestrian, and the crossroads needs to be more than ordinary, more than pedestrian. Uh, it's going to be the centerpiece of Scarborough for many, many years to come. And what we do now and the architecture that we look at now is going to set the tone for the rest. I've said that for the rest of the development. Mm -hmm. I've said that before. I'll say it now. I will probably be saying it again uh, as we go along. That's it. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just pick up on on that theme. Um, you know, I'm I'm generally okay with the architecture. I, I guess I, you know, to be totally frank, um, I guess I was I was also hoping for something a little more distinctive. Um, uh, perhaps architecturally, if not uh, architecturally and or color wise, um, and I, you know, I understand that the that this that this model, this sort of template, makes a lot of economic sense, and I, I understand that one of the many balances to strike with this project is that between uh, the placemaking and sort of the, you know, the this notion that this is kind of a centerpiece for Scarborough and it's a huge opportunity, and we want to this phase in particular to be sort of the gateway, balancing that with the fact that we also want it to succeed economically. Um, we totally appreciate that. So, I mean, I, I'm generally not one to, you know, each of us kind of has our, you know, certain things that we tend to focus on a little more. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to die on the hill of color selections per se, but um, I, you know, I, I would just encourage you to Continue to look at that and think about the, um, you know, the what could pitch, potentially be done to add a little bit more interest and variety, um, mm -hmm. given the which I, I we all know that you completely appreciate the you know the, the importance of this, um, and then on on a similar note um, in terms of you know landscaping and and trees and so forth I think you know. That's another area where I think there, and it sounds like there is, but I just hope there continues to be a lot of uh, special focus on maintaining trees wherever possible and, and feasible and, and creating um, robust landscaping uh, so that you know it's not just a field of white buildings. And I, I know that's not what you have in mind, but I'll just go on record saying that. Um, and um, just sort of looking back through the notes here, um, you know, the, the, we'll look forward to seeing the, the traffic counts and the traffic analysis and some of the other things that are in progress. Um, appreciate the, you know, the integrated approach to the affordable housing and the fact that you've been able to do that. I mean, we've certainly had a lot of other well-intentioned developers in town who have not been able to make that work for a variety of reasons. Um, and so um, we, we all appreciate that. Um, 
you know, just briefly on stormwater and, and the, low, the low impact design, um, you know, I, I appreciate Ms. Uh, Saunders' comments, um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I think it's important to, uh, at least for me, to, to state that I, I don't have any reason to think that the, that the team is not thinking diligently about this stuff and um, working in, in good faith. Um, I understand that it's been a recurring theme throughout this process that when you're dealing with individual phases within kind of a master plan, so to speak, that you know, we do have to make sure we're keeping track of things as we go so that there isn't this kind of creep. So I think that's a very valid, um, very valid comment. Um, and um, at the same time, though, I think, I, I think you get it, and uh, I know you get it, and um, I'm sure you'll be mindful of that and kind of weaving that into everything as you go forward. And as you said, Dan, um, there are some balances to be struck here, and um, um, you know, that's all what we're kind of trying to work together to achieve. So, um, you know, again, I, I won't read through all the all the items and the staff comments, uh, but um, you know, one thing just on a housekeeping level, as you know, is going forward just to help us keep track of where we are and what's already been addressed is sort of a running list of how comments have been addressed or what, what responses are to that. So it helps for continuity's sake. Um, but beyond that, um, I think things have been covered pretty well at this stage and we'll look forward to seeing the next step. All right. And I guess you can just wait up there right? while I introduce the next one. Uh, M&R Holdings LLC requests a site plan <clears throat> review for lots two and three of Crossroads Plan Development District Phase One Assessor's Map R52 Lot Four. Jamal, would you like to enter this one? Sure. I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, it's the same sort of review process. It's just high level discussion tonight and no final action. Um, the applicant's proposing to construct an 1100 foot long private street to provide access to eight duplexes and four eight unit condominium buildings on lot two. And on lot three, the applicant's proposing a 9500 square foot memory care facility. Uh, staff does recommend for clarity of record, the applicant submit two separate site plan applications going forward for each lot. This will help to facilitate a cleaner review process by the board. Um, in the near future and the long term as well. So that's just a suggestion. Um, so that's what I have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bacon. Thank you. Um, as was introduced, uh, this is this plan shows both lot two and three. Um, and this is the area that uh, is just south of the multifamily lot one that we just discussed. It's closer to Route One um, than that other area, and it it's the first kind of gateway into the project. Um, lot two has uh, four eight unit um, condominiums and those are fronting the Downs Road. So that's, again, has a balance of some on-street parking out front to kind of create that uh, more walkable kind of village environment along the primary street coming in. There also is the majority of the parking behind those units with a mix of um, uncovered and covered parking spaces. So there's 24 uh, garages that are uh, will go along with these these 48 units. So half of the units can be provided uh, covered parking, and then the the remaining is exterior uh, parking. And again, around kind of landscaping, um, the streetscape is going to be very robust coming in on the Downs Road and going to be duplicated within the project. Um, so with those units uh, fronting the Downs Road, um, the other units are along this kind of horseshoe shaped um, uh, interconnected street that comes into uh, to lot two and serves primarily the uh, these duplex units. And the duplex units are single story. Um, they're a mix of uh, units with one garage bay each or one and two garage bays depending on um, the, the various units along the street um, and 
Um, this, act this road system is proposed to be private, unlike the, the other, more of a traditional condominium association. So there actually isn't a right-of-way, a street right-of-way within this lot two. It's gonna look like a street, it's gonna act like a street, um, but it's not gonna be on the same property as the, the, the entire condominium development. It'll be privately maintained um, as an association. Um, we talked a bit about kind of balance and LID approaches, avoiding wetland impacts. Um, this is an area where there's a wetland finger that kind of comes up from, you, know, you can see it in the core of the plan. It kind of runs north-south, and we've um, done our best to treat that with low-impact development design. Uh, where we've preserved over half of that wetland area while also providing the interconnected street that the, the zoning and, and the plan calls for. And we're, we really focused design on kind of highlighting that wetland feature as an asset, not to resource-wise, but also from a stormwater standpoint and also just the, from an amenity standpoint. Um, so that will be a heavily landscaped um, wetland, calling it a sort of a wetland common with a trail system that goes by it with a boardwalk actually um, on, on the westerly side of it. And then there's low impact uh, bioretention cells around it that provide some stormwater management and treatment before uh, along the edge of it. And that the landscaping of that's gonna be native and kind of it's gonna be integrated. So it's gonna look and act like a, a natural place. Um, beyond that, like the other uh, lot one, there's sidewalks on both sides. So it's designed to be very walkable um, and connected to the sidewalks along the Downs Road. And uh, again, we're working on the lighting plan that hasn't been provided. The delay in the lighting plan is to have it meet town standards, but also be coordinated for the entire uh, phase one of the project. So we're well on our way with the lighting plan. We'll bring that back to you um, at the next review of, of the plan. And uh, like lot one, um, there we're working on the affordable housing component of that um, and hope to be providing affordable home ownership units um, within this phase, uh, we're shooting for between two and four of those, and Rocky's working directly with the Housing Alliance on the formula for that. The town has, has a program for rental affordable housing, um, which is being complied with in other projects, including Carrier Woods, but there isn't uh, really a framework for home ownership. So that's being worked on again, diligently by both us and the Housing Alliance, and we'll have that, a game plan in place um, to deliver affordable housing in this, this lot too as well. Um, in terms of architecture, uh, the, on my screen, I guess we have the, the, the site plan up, but um, Jamal, if you can toggle back to our, our screen, um, there's, two-story, eight-unit building proposed. Um, again, it has architecture that's intended to be theme-oriented and coordinated with the other buildings. Um, whites, a you very... Wanna, uh, sorry, you might want to undo it. Undo. Okay. It's sort of my default. Go to you. Speaking of white, <laughs> um, these buildings are designed to, to match uh, the, the 12 units in, in lot one. And we've tried to actually take cues from New England architecture and went with white uh, intentionally um, to be kind of clean and have clapboards and battens and to be kind of distinctive from a New England architecture standpoint. We can look at that again. Um, I think the feeling was in some other schemes, too many colors kind of detracts from the design, um, but I think we can 
we'll look at that again and, and come back to the board and, and have further discussions on kind of colors and, and architectural distinctiveness. Uh, we felt that um, these can be quite attractive with, uh, with um, significant trim, with um, a change in materials, and with fairly contemporary, uh, contemporary look. Um, the <coughs> duplex units, obviously different architecture. These are the single story, um, more cottage style. Um, this has kind of a mix of those materials, but also it has some white to correspond with other buildings within the project, but also um, gray shingles to actually correspond with the development proposed on lot three, which is going to be a gray shingled uh, memory care facility that we'll talk about next. And um, again, with kind of black trimmed windows and um, kind of low lying roof lines, but also peaks to, to vary the facades. The porches are intentionally designed to come out towards the street and to be the face of each unit and to be closer to the street than the garages <coughs> and, and providing some space for parking that's tucked back towards the building and so the parking is not the primary feature at the site and at the curb. Um, so this, this building shows, or this rendering shows a scenario with a two bay garage and then a one, um, which will be one of the programs and there'll be a one and a one. In terms of lot three, um, lot three is proposed to include um, a memory care facility. It would have 12 beds, essentially 12 rooms um, for for residences, for residents. Um, it's modeled directly off of the moorings and it's the same development team, um, which is a fairly new facility in Cumberland. Um, this is their, their design and their elevation uh, in Cumberland and what they want to duplicate here in Scarborough with some minor, uh, minor modifications. This is actually a picture of the, of the facility. It's very residential in scale, um, and we think it'll be a very positive uh, asset to this end of the neighborhood and this kind of makeup of a mix of two-story and a mix of single-story um, with the other unit types um, in this lot two and three. And so again, it has cedar, single, sh cedar shingles um, and shakes and it has white trim that I think can complement the other architecture. It's around just under 10,000 square feet in terms of um, footprint and um, the site plan proposes to include 24 parking spaces um, and which is a bit more than the ordinance requirements but it's based on what they need at their Cumberland facility to accommodate both staff and then guests that come and visit residents. Um, there's also a drop-off area that's designed um, along the street and that's for primarily for the for the bus and van service that they have on site to take residents to um, to other destinations to, to get out and off site. And I think these folks are really excited about the project in terms of being part of the community, being across from the common um, having the trail system and small park and they anticipate in addition to having <coughs> this building they're going to have some raised beds, some gardens, they have a garden shed and, and utility area. And they also have an enclosed courtyard that's going to have, um, that'll be right outside uh, the facility and provide outdoor space uh, for residents. Um, like a uh, lot Lot one, traffic is we're looking at and continuing to kind of diagnose at the subdivision level. And um, I think that's what I have for a presentation on, on these two lots. Okay. Thank you. Um, one last time, I'll open it up for any public comment. All right, seeing none, we'll go to the board. I suspect there may be some recurring themes. But, um, Rachel, would you like to start off? Yeah. Um, I really like the uh, design of the uh, memory care, but you, you said they had a van. Is there going to be a garage for that, or is it going to be stored on site, or what? There's not a garage proposed, no. So um, I believe it's either going to be stored on site or 
or it could be shared with the Cumberland facility. I can check with them in terms of if that's if it's a permanent fixture or, or not there, uh, you know, or there when needed and, and in Cumberland when it's being used there. Yeah, okay. Um, I think my, my comments about the architecture of the uh, of the uh, two-story condos uh, reflects the, those are the first four white blocks. Um, the, uh, the condos, the, the duplexes, I think they do reflect a uh, more varied sort of architecture uh, with the, the different um, materials that are being used, the porch, the emphasis on making it more of a, of a community. Uh, so to that extent, uh, although that's an awful broad expanse of roof over <laughs> the three garages with just a blank roof there. I don't know what else it might be done or could be done or should be done. It's just an observation um, for you folks to take a look at. Um, so I, I think those reflect more uh, of what I was expecting or what I was hoping for. Uh, I don't mind, I actually don't mind white buildings uh, as long as some, there's some variety there, which I can see in these duplexes. I had uh, a question originally about that wetland park. I think when we saw it originally, that open area. I think when we saw it originally, it was envisioned that there would be more there in the line of uh, availability of barbecue pits or picnic areas. Um, but I understand if uh, what came up was a lot more wetlands than you might have might have considered. Um, but I I do kind of hate to to lose those community eating places because when when folks can meet together for for food, they, there's also a greater connection of community. Um, so it's, it's too bad that some of that's taken up. Um, and and uh, I don't know what you can do about it. But I, I just, uh, I really appreciated the thought that had gone into that originally, and it's too bad that more, is, more of it, that area is gone. It's going to be tough to fly kites running through right. the wetland. Uh, I think that's uh, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, what Rachel just said about um, the architecture. Um, again, uh, sort of the um, the, the multi-family uh, complexes kind of a thing. The unit condos. I, again, I think the architecture missed the mark a little bit on type two with the duplexes. Um, there's way too much, again, roof per, you know, fascia sort of um, ratio. And I think, you know, a simple dormer or something like that could be put in there to just uh, break it up a little bit. But I do like the, 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 the um, that you use different um, textures and building materials. So I think, you know, you're definitely on to something there. And the Cumberland, the moorings is, is I think, I think it epitomizes the New England style that you know that that folks were thinking of, kind of a thing. But in general, um, I don't want to belabor sort of the comments that I gave before regarding low impact development. I think I think um, that we have missed the mark a little bit on this too, because eventually we are going to have flooding issues when you think of all the impervious area here. And again, I, I need to reiterate that we need to be keeping track of where are we at for impervious area? What have we, what are we, what have we eaten up? Because not only eventually are we going to have flooding issues, but eventually we could potentially have water quality it, um, issues, um, particularly because I, I was a little disappointed with the the um, the uh, recommendation for a sediment pond. Um, and actually there was a, just a study that came out last week that says that sediment ponds are actually one of the biggest uh, contributors to phosphorus loading. Um, and I'm happy to send the articles to you that came out of both WEF, the Water Environment Federation, and from uh, the Minnesota DEQ. 
So I was a little disappointed to see old school sort of sed ponds kind of a thing, sed basins. And I was hoping that we would see a little more uh, decentralized sort of um, stormwater treatment, but also just thinking about um, the impacts that that are there, um, those being tracked, whether it's impervious area, disturbed area, wetlands impacts, impacts to habitat. Just wondering if you guys could let us know too where you're at with the natural resource inventory with respect to um, not only just the land natural resources, but also habitat, beginning with habitat. I think you guys were gonna look at those maps to see if, do we have New England cottontail, you know, anywhere in town here and on this property and are we infringe upon that anywhere? Um, but again, uh, um, pretty much the same comments as, as lot one. Um, a question about the private road. Um, it sounds like eventually that you'll have a road association because it will be, or will it just be maintained by the condo association, the private roads that were mentioned? It's going to be maintained by the homeowner association of the lot owner or the unit owners within that entire phase. Okay. Will it? Will and it? Be um, a the moorings will be part of that association, given they good. are provided access to okay. to their Excellent. site. Will it meet town standards? Just in case, eventually. Um, it's being those... designed um, from a construction standpoint. It's, be it's being designed the same way. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Elsa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, just, um, do you have a, um, the garage? Do you have any drawings of the garage? I don't know if I missed it in the packet. No, we, we don't have elevations of the garages for the A units. Yeah. Um, they're going to correspond architecturally, but there is, we don't have renderings of those at this point. And then, um, you know, the beauty's in the eye of the beholder, so I'm, I'm all set with your white buildings. And I do, I do have to say that the, um, the duplex style ones do have a nice touch to them with the, mm -hmm. the extra bump outs and the, the color. It is a nice look, so again, keep it in mind. Um, there's not a whole lot else here I see. Um, poses a huge issue. I did see the mulch path, so it's like a compacted, like, explain a mulch path to me. Is it, is it just mulch? <laughs> the the pathway, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be. We're, yeah, it's going to be kind of uh, wood chip type path. Okay, yeah. like wood chips. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was just trying to visualize how that was going to work. All right. That's it. I don't have much else to add. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? Uh, sure. Um, I, um, I just want to make a comment about the architecture. First of all, I think the memory care units look really nice. I hope I never have to live in one, but, <laughs> but they look nice. Um, I do like the duplex, and I was wondering, um, being res you know, respectful of what you're trying to do here in terms of the market and everything, if you could take like the, the shingles on the peaks of the duplex, the, the gray shingles, and incorporate those into the other, you know, the two-story condos and the, um, and the apartments that we talked about in the first phase. I don't know if that's doable, if that would work within your, your model or anything like that, but I, I think that would give a nice accent to those buildings. Break up the whiteness of them. May I address that? Sure. Happy to talk about it. How to design by committee. We've already done that in our own, <laughs> within our own operation, designed by a committee. Um, we've had our architect heavily involved. We, as a consensus, came up with the board and batten style as something we thought that looked really nice and, and not something that you see every day. It's a little different. We thought it had a nice look. We certainly could use more shingle if, if the board felt, uh, you know, that that, 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 that looked better. Um, I'm frankly a little bit concerned with some of the comments I've heard from some of the members on the overall architecture of, of, uh, of those, those first buildings. Um, by design, we want something that's close to the street, large in scale, um, and so we felt that those met, you know, th these were design parameters that we came up with with Dan and Nick Aceto and, and, and our architects talking about what it is we want. Um, we need to hit a home run with this phase. We're not, we're not trying to hit a, a single, a double, or a triple. We need a home run. 
And that's one of the reasons why we went to these style buildings. We know they'll be attractive. We know the ones that need to sell will sell if we can hit the price range we need to be at. And we know those units will rent. And so it's very important to us to, to build that style building in that location. And I think ultimately it, it's going to look very, very nice. I realize it is the gateway into the downs. Uh, but if something doesn't, uh, doesn't get going here with phase one and it's not a home run, we won't have to worry about the rest of the downs. Uh, this, this is super important. So happy to take input from the board. Uh, tweaks like that, like, like Mr. Uh, Billy has suggested, we certainly can handle. Uh, but I, I would like to get some buy-in from the board and get, get an understanding that that style building is what we are proposing. We do think it meets the criteria, and, and that's where we want to go with the project. Uh, you, know, you know, I think it's, um, at least from my perspective, you're not, you know, I, my impression is you're not trying to create another Dunstan Village or Crossing or Eastern Village. You're, you're reaching the market below that. And you, you know you've got a product that sells. It's in, there's a demand for it. Obviously, you can't seem to build enough of them. Um, but I think our, our concern is, in the communities, is that this is such an important, such a focal point of the community. That you know anything you can do a little tweak here and there, um, and still maintain what you want to do in terms of your your, your model. You know, mm -hmm. for this particular site, I think would be would be helpful. Okay. That's all I have. Yeah. yeah, and I'll just pick up on that briefly. Um, I mean, I think, you know, for myself, and I think generally speaking for the board, um, uh, it, I, I think there's a general acknowledgement and understanding of the, the overall architectural <coughs> vernacular that you're talking about here and the scale, and I think we all understand going back to the workshops and even before that, that you know, just based on the underlying zoning here, that you know, this really is intended to have some scale and proximity to the street. Um, and so, you know, my comment earlier about trees and so forth is not meant to say we want to, want you to hide the buildings or anything, uh, but just to you know to really have it be um, have some uh, have some balance to it, you know, so that there there is, there is some greenery and nice landscaping, and it's not just sort of an open open field, as I said. Um, I mean, I, I think, again, and I, I can't obviously officially speak for the board, but just my sense of the discussion this evening is that we probably are talking more at the level, order of magnitude of tweaks in terms of maybe some accents with different building materials, shingles as, as suggested, or, you know, maybe a little bit of variation in color. I understand where you're coming from there. Um, and I, I definitely know, you know, from my own day job experience that sometimes people can get a little crazy with, with color and you want to add vibrancy and all that and it ends up looking um, a little bit goofy. Um, and I understand there's a maintenance aspect to it too and, and, and all that, but um, I, mean, I, think, I think there's a general consensus that it's really more on the level of tweaks and, and adding some interest. Um, Getting back to you know this, these particular phases, like others, I, I really do like that uh, architecture of the duplexes. Um, I think I like what you've done with the, the porches, and it's you know it's a style that you don't see a whole lot in town. Um, and I think one of the important things about this project is that it does provide some diversity of housing types, um, and so I think that's a positive. Um, like others, I, I really like the memory care facility design, and uh, both because it you know, embodies that kind of New England vernacular, but also because I think it's a good it's a good meeting of marriage of sort of the form and function, if you will. Um, it just seems very comfortable. Um, and uh, beyond that, I don't think we need to belabor anything else. You know, some good discussion around low impact design and um, some of the other topics that were covered and then just some some uh, deliverables that we'll, we'll wait to see and, and digest. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Any 
staff report or staff comments? We do. Quite a few, actually. Um, <laughs> so three. Um, so the draft comp plan uh, was made available last week online. Comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. um, you can find it at the town's website or in scarboroughengaged.org. Uh, the Long Range Planning Committee will be getting together this week to discuss uh, the public participation process for the plan. And if I can just jump in, that will be tomorrow evening, actually. Yes. Right. It will be yeah. Long Range Planning will be meeting on that. Um, the serv there's also a survey um, out, which is online and in the Scarborough Leader uh, last week to test some of the draft policies set forth in the comp plan draft. Uh, the second item is a uh, Jay, our planning director, is working with the town attorney on setting up a joint workshop with the Board of Appeals and Planning Board in August, uh, sort of a nuts and bolts um, of serving on a public board such as this. Um, so that'll be, information will be forthcoming on that. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll just elaborate on that a little <coughs> bit more. Um, I had a little bit of, a little bit of communication with Jay after the, the, well, I guess it was two meetings ago when we had Verizon in front of us last time, and there had been some sense that a workshop might be helpful or appropriate, and I think uh, the consensus ended up being that rather than having a workshop focused specifically on that proposal, that it would be appropriate to really focus it more on kind of general procedures with a, with a special emphasis on some of these legal questions that were giving some of us fits and <coughs> some of it comes down to you know where do we have discretion where are we you know and or and where are we really kind of um, hemmed in in terms of, of the ordinance and so forth because I think some of what some folks were struggling with was were some of those gray areas where you know it wasn't all completely spelled out and I think at the end of the day there are always going to be certain points at which we just have to exercise our quasi-judicial duties and make some judgments to the best of our ability. So I think that's really part of the spirit behind that. And it'll hopefully help us as we continue to, to, um, to deliberate on that particular item and others going forward. And I think as a general practice, we've tried to do it you know, periodically just to keep us all refreshed. So thanks. Thank you. And then finally, um, as you all know, Karen's last day with the town of Scarborough is August 3rd. She and her family are, are moving closer to home and relatives and on to new adventures and we're really excited for her and sad here. Um, we just want to say we appreciate her work with this committee, the Long Rangers and Board of Appeals and many others um, and you know her amazing customer service skills and attention to detail has been greatly appreciated. I started in October and she's made my job much easier than it could be. So I know that I appreciate Karen, and I'm sure I can speak for the rest of the staff and for the board. So good luck, Karen. Thank you. Yeah. This will be your last meeting. Right. Yeah. I'd just like to comment on how um, accommodating Karen has been to provide you know, whatever we need to, to facilitate our review process as volunteers. And she's always receptive to, to you know, my darn revisions to the minutes. So thank you. <laughs> I love them. So much. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo both of those comments and also just, you know, you know, just note that in addition to all the time she has spent here, she also has done, served in a similar capacity for other boards and committees, including long range planning, and um, it's been uh, great to have her and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to uh, congratulate Jamel on a Mm -hmm. Successful first meeting. Thank you. Now that he's uh, moved beyond the learner's permit phase. And, <laughs> uh, so nice job and look forward to working with thanks. you. After the last forward. meeting, this was a piece of cake. Oh. <laughs> thank so you, sir. thanks. Uh, anything else? Um, we don't have any administrative amendments to report. Right. <clears throat> um, planning board correspondence. I know we all received copies of, uh, of some correspondence that followed our uh, uh, Star Homes Versace. Well, we had the Star Homes Versace, uh, not Versace, but Versace, <laughs> Versace, <laughs> Versace um, correspondence, but also there was a packet of emails that followed the last Verizon um, yeah. 
discussion. Any other correspondence to report? I have. Uh, I received a phone call this afternoon ish um, regarding one of our agenda items. I was. Uh, Asked the gentleman to kind of put his comments in writing and said that I'd have to disclose anything he told me to the full board. And um, he was somewhat supportive of Piper Shore's um, proposal and was was concerned about uh, the conservation aspects of it. So that was that was it. Okay. So Thank I'll you. Let you guys know. <laughs> All right. Um, any planning board comments, Roger? Uh, yes, I want to report on the Transportation Committee meeting that we had on June 26th. Um, I'm always uh, amazed when I go to these meetings because there's quite a bit going on in town that I'm, I'm absolutely convinced most people have no clue what's happening, you know. Um, we, we talked about the uh, PAX Route 1 Complete Streets Car Study, which is a, some sort of a, a plan involving Saco and Scarborough on Route 1, um, looking at how to improve that. Uh, we deal with that almost uh, with any development along Route 1. You know, Route 1 becomes the issue. Um, there's also um, activity going on in the 114.22 out in the O'Donnell's area, that, that area down there. Then we had a, a quite a lengthy discussion about collector roads, sidewalks, you know, what developments warrant having sidewalks, which roads, you know, that whole thing, that's a, that's a big issue. And um, then the bids are coming in tomorrow for um, Gorham Road. Um, bids, plural. So there's, gonna, there's a lot of activity going on there. And finally, I guess the LED streetlight status, that must be pretty much completed by now, isn't it? Or the phase one is pretty much complete. Um, that's the Cobra heads, those um, arms that you see on the major corridors. Um, the phase two will begin soon, in the next few weeks, and it'll be into the subdivisions where you see those, like, the coach lantern type fixtures being retrofitted. Um, so mm. that's our next phase. And um, so that's it. I mean, we have another meeting next week. And I'm sure it'll be, you know, these meetings go about two, two hours. Mm -hmm. Pretty involved, and I'm really surprised at how how much is involved in it. If I knew this much, I wouldn't have volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very good advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Just think no, of how, it, we'll it plug, is, how much it, more plugged in you are. No, it, it, it is very interesting. Yeah. And yeah, I'll just quickly comment, as some others may have um, had the opportunity to check out Dunstan T Tap and Table Restaurant, which is now open um, over as part of the Dunstan Crossing development. And uh, that's not to endorse the restaurant per se, but just to say it's nice to see that uh, come to fruition um, and to be kind of in that on that site and be able to picture what those plans look like. And um, I think a lot of times when we've had these mixed uh, mixed use uh, communities that have been proposed and approved, you know, the, the commercial often is the last thing that gets mm -hmm. done or it gets deferred. Um, so I, just for me personally, it was kind of nice to see that. Um, that done and up and running, you know, during the summer. Were so. you able to walk there on the sidewalk? I did not. Uh, I did not attempt that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm report back, back, back on that next time. Uh, anything else? All right. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you.